morning, everybody. Um, so my screen says that it's nine o'clock. So we're gonna get started here in a little bit. Um, for anybody that wasn't here when I put in the chat, I'm gonna add in the PDF copies of all of the presentations today into the chat once we get started in a little bit. Um, I did send out the PDFs via email on uh, Saturday morning, but I got quite a few um, bounce backs. Uh, so I'm gonna put that in the chat just to make sure everybody gets a copy of that. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. We are gonna go through um, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping this morning. Um, so just bear with me a little bit and then we're gonna jump right into disorders um, of field tomatoes and peppers. We will have a break a little bit later too. Um, so you guys can get some more coffee and make sure that you're nice and fresh. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so my name is Amanda Tracy. I am one of four vegetable crop specialists with OMAFRA and I'm based out of uh, Ridgetown campus. Um, so we're gonna go over some Zoom rules for today. So please, if you could make sure that you stay on mute um, unless, uh, unless one of the uh, co-hosts or presenters uh, would like you to open it up for questions, that's their call. But for the most time, please just make sure you're on mute. You can also put your questions in chat. Um, and then you can also use the reactions button if you would like to thumbs up something that you like or anything like that. Um, please also note that we are recording this session um, and a video will be available later on for anybody that missed the session and is looking to um, catch up a little bit. So this workshop is one in um, a series of IPM workshops that's being hosted by OMAFRA this season. We do it every season. So last Thursday, the 29th, um, we, they held the introductory session. Um, so I'm not gonna go over a lot of the stuff that was covered there. If you missed the introductory session, just let uh, me or one of the other specialists know and um, we can get you a link to that video when it's available. Um, also note that this is for field grown tomatoes and peppers. So if you're looking for um, any control measures, we're not gonna be covering that here. And we're also not gonna be covering greenhouse cropping systems. Uh, there is a greenhouse course that you can take. It's usually held at the end of November, um, but there is a fee associated to that, I believe, because it's a pretty intense five day course. So if that's something that you're interested, I sincerely apologize, but that's not what we're gonna be covering today. Okay, so this is uh, what our schedule looks like for today. Um, so we're gonna have a quick intro with me, Amanda, and then I'm gonna play a video I recorded earlier this week on disorders of tomatoes and peppers. Um, and then we're gonna tag uh, Dr. Cheryl Truman in and she's gonna cover diseases. We're gonna have a quick break, moving on to Cheryl again, covering insects. Then we're gonna go to uh, Dr. Darren Robinson. Uh, he's gonna cover weeds and herbicide injury symptoms. Then we're gonna move on to another AMAFRA specialist, Ann Verholland. She's going to cover some soil problems and soil sampling. And then we're gonna move on to another OMAFRA specialist, to Tajendra Shepigan. And he is gonna be covering the nutrient deficiencies and how to do some tissue sampling, which is really interesting. All right, so just in case, this is what we look like. So there's me, Ann and Tajendra. And then we also have Sharon, Cheryl and Darren, and we're the ones that are gonna be covering all of your topics here today. So if you have any questions, please let us know. Um, we are all very open to answering any of your questions. Okay, so we're just gonna jump into a little bit of background on the industry here before we go into the actual disorders. So this is an updated table I update it every year. So this one is from 2015 to 2020. So it shows the average farm value of the major Ontario field vegetables grown in Ontario. Um, so as you can see, field tomatoes are actually the second highest farm value at an average of just over 90,000, um, 90 million, sorry, <laughs> grossing a, a year. And then peppers are a little bit farther down um, between like right around 40 or so. So it just kind of shows you the value of the pepper of the peppers and tomatoes that you're going to be scouting this year um, and how much they really mean to these growers and how important it is that you do a really good job and that we, we cover all this information really well. 
So field grown tomatoes. So there are different varieties and different end uses um, for fresh market and processing tomatoes. And those are the, the, the way that we group a lot of the vegetables that are grown in Ontario. They're either grown for processing or they're grown for fresh market. And um, a lot of the growing systems are quite different depending on where the end, the end result is the end fruit is going. Um, so in Ontario processing tomatoes, we have um, just over 10,500 acres of processing tomatoes in Ontario in 2019. End uses are things like paste, um, whole peel, juice, diced, um, all canned products. Um, and then we usually harvest these as a once over destructive machine harvest. For fresh market, you're looking at less than a thousand acres of fresh market tomatoes in Ontario. Um, one of the, the end uses here uh, are obviously like grocery stores and that kind of thing. So you really want to make sure you have a uniform col color and that there's no damage to that fruit. Um, so this is hand harvested multiple times throughout the season and they are collected into small bins and containers. So it's not a destructive harvest, which is a, a key difference. So for peppers, um, peppers are not as easy to gather information on as it is tomatoes. So we estimate that there are just over 2000 acres of field, grown of field grown peppers in Ontario. And the majority of this is for processing. Um, they are usually hand harvested throughout the season. And then there's a destructive uh, mow at the end of the final harvest. Um, something to note is some early adopters of processing peppers are actually trying out some non-destructive mechanical harvesters. Um, and that would be, that's going to be something really interesting to see how that works out. Um, so that's very, very new. Okay, so just, just some pictures here to show the differences between the fresh market and the processing. So as you can see, if you look to the far left there, the size of the plant that they're that are going in the ground is quite different between fresh market and processing. The fresh market is quite a bit more advanced and the processing is, is a lot smaller. When you look at the way that these, these transplants are planted, so fresh market, you usually have some sort of plastic mulch cover and they're staked to keep the fruit off the ground and to stop them from getting any of the blemishes on there. And then for the processing, we usually plant in twin rows. There are some growers that do plant in single rows, but majority seems to be those that double row system. And um, there's no staking, it's a determinant variety. So they'll, they'll just lay on the ground and the machine harvest will go over top. Um, planting style, a little, bit, a little bit different just because the fresh market gets planted into the plastic mulch um, and uh, the um, transplanter for the processing is more of that carousel style planter where it gets dropped into the trench. And then as you can see, there's also differences in the harvesting, right? So we have baskets versus the destructive harvest, how those are handled going into large wagons versus going into boxes and stuff like that, which would go off to fresh market. And the final end product is quite different as well. For peppers, um, growing styles are a, a little bit more similar. Um, so the transplants again are like a lot bigger for fresh market versus processing. Um, a lot of peppers are planted in double rows. The difference with fresh market is that they're put on plastic mulch again, whereas processing they're not. Again, there are some growers that like to plant their processing peppers in single rows, but primarily we see doubles. Again, hand harvest is pretty common for both processing and fresh market um, peppers. And then there'll be a big uh, mow at the end of the processing pepper season and it'll chop all those plants right down. Okay, so it's really important to know what you're scouting. So knowing your plant variety, what the end product is and what your ideal growing conditions are is actually quite important because it'll help you focus on different things. So for example, in processing tomatoes, if you know that you're scouting a whole pack field, it's really important to know um, and to pay attention on the fruit to make sure there aren't any blemishes because you don't want any skin tags on that fruit when they're going to get peeled. Versus if you're growing something that's gonna be diced, there might be a little bit more uh, flexibility there. Um, so just for today, um, what we're trying to accomplish here anyways is uh, 
hopefully you'll be able to go out into the fields and you'll be able to know your common pests and issues, what part of the plant that they target. So you can, you can have an idea of, of uh, um, how they're gonna affect your plants and um, recognize and spotting problems in the fields, maybe even being able to diagnose a few of them. If not, um, we'll be going over some techniques to uh, take really good pictures and samples to help somebody else be able to diagnose that. So again, that intro session um, was held on April 28th. There will be a video available at some point if you missed it. Um, just in case, um, for today, I'm going to go over a few scouting basics just so everybody has a little bit of knowledge before we jump into uh, to the more in-depth stuff. So um, one, there are three main things that you really need to do when you're in the field. So the first is that you want to make sure that you're walking a random path through the field. You don't want to be walking the same pattern every time because then you're going to miss a lot of spots. You also want to make sure that you're stopping frequently to check the plants and the problem areas. So really get down in there into the plants, lift them up, check underneath the leaves and make sure that you're really looking very closely at those plants. Um, if you have any traps or anything in the field, you want to make sure that you're checking those, record any catch numbers on there, um, ID any identifications of pests on there. Um, and your dates, etc. cetera. Um, and the third is that you want to try and diagnose or record problem areas so somebody else can diagnose them. So making sure that you're taking really good notes, things like history of the field, where the issue is in the field, how big is the area, what part of the plant is affected, and taking those good notes can help you throughout the season see how these problems are progressing or if even if um, one of the growers goes in and does an application of a pesticide, if that pesticide is actually doing its job. Another thing is that you want to take a lot of pictures, making sure you take a variety of angles, um, different lightings, try and take pictures of healthy areas versus the affected areas, what kind of damage it causes. If it's an insect, maybe different life stages could help us figure out what it is. And all of our cell phones have really great cameras nowadays, so there's no excuse why we can't take a good picture. Um, then another thing that you could do is um, taking samples. So depending on the issue, um, you can take a sample of the whole plant if it's not too big, um, or the affected area of the plant, or just taking some of the insects or the insect damage as well. Um, some basic tools and stuff that I like to have on hand. So this is a pretty exhaustive list here, but some of the basics are highlighted in red. Um, so, you know, your smartphone or a tablet, something that you can take pictures or notes on. Um, make sure you have a knife and a hand lens, maybe a couple plastic bags and a marker in case you want to take a sample. A trowel is always good to have in case you want to take a look at the root system. Um, some hand sanitizer um, for disinfecting your hands and your tools, and a cooler with ice packs. So if you do take any samples, you can keep them nice and cool. So I know in the intro session, they, there was a whole presentation on taking good pictures and how to do it. And I just really wanna stress the importance <clears throat> of taking really good pictures. So here, I have an example of two diff of two pictures. They're identical. It's just the focus is different. So making sure that you focus on what actually is the problem can really help here. So if you look at the first picture on the left, it looks like we have a picture there of some damage, right? So in that picture, okay, it looks like you know there's something going on in the field. But if you look at the picture on the right, we're focusing on a very healthy transplant in the back and it doesn't look like anything's going on. So if you were to send me the picture on the left, I would have a very different idea of what's going on in the field versus if you sent me the picture on the right. So making sure you're focusing on the, the correct uh, part of the plant that you want um, is really important. So another one is taking a variety of pictures. So these three pictures are not very good. The lighting's pretty poor. There's some reflections. One's a little bit fuzzy, but because we have a variety of angles and, of, and um, we have a bunch of different pictures, I'm able to point out different things in each one of the pictures. And because of that, I'm able to actually figure out, you know, that this is a brown marmorated stink bug nymph. Okay, so that's just the general overview. If you have any questions, please type them in the chat there and I'll be happy to answer them. 
Um, just bear with me here. I'm going to stop screen sharing and then I'm going to move on to the video of disorders and um, and then we'll jump right in. All right, so we're just going to watch this video. It's just about 20 minutes long and then um, we will be having a little quiz after, so try to pay attention. Well, crop specialist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. And this lecture today is gonna to provide us with an overview of the common disorders that are often observed in field-grown tomatoes and peppers. Um, so this is one of many in a series of IPM scout training workshops for 2021. The first uh, introductory workshop was held on um, April 29th, which is a Thursday. So if you missed that, please reach out to one of the specialists and we can um, get you a link to that video. So let's dive in. Okay, so just starting off, we have a few resources here. Um, so if you haven't heard of Ontario Crop IPM, it's actually a really great resource for a variety of different fruit and vegetable crops, um, especially if you're looking for more information on common diseases, disorders, and pests. Um, it's great for resources for scouting um, and helping with scout timing. And um, us vegetable crop specialists and fruit crop and fruit crop specialists feed into this and put this information out there for you. Um, another thing that's really interesting to follow if you want some more uh, real-time updates is to visit us on our blog at onvegetables.com. Um, that's where we post a lot of the articles if you're looking for educational workshops or if you're looking for any updates on what's going on in the crops, um, you can look there as well. So what is a disorder? So this is a physiological plant disorder, and there are abnormalities that are caused by abiotic factors, such as wind um, or other extreme weather conditions, and even nutrient deficiencies or availabilities. So I'm gonna start off with the weather-related weather disorders. Um, so things like frost, chilling, um, wind or sand blasting, hail and lightning are some of the ones we're gonna go over today. So we're gonna start off with frost damage. So frost damage occurs um, in tomatoes when uh, the temperature is either below minus one or minus two. Um, for peppers, they're a little bit more sensitive than tomatoes. So if you have a temperature below zero, um, you're gonna get frost kill on your pepper plants. So symptoms that you'll see in the field, the whole plant should be affected. Um, you should be also be able to see this um, pretty evenly spread across the field. Um, sometimes, depending if your topography of the field is a little bit more hilly, you might see patches um, where, cert where certain areas of the field were able to reach that damage, um, that temperature, where and others maybe weren't. So chilling damage is a little bit different from frost damage. So this is, um, this happens when your air temperatures are below 10 degrees Celsius or even your soil temperatures reach uh, less than 15 degrees Celsius for tomatoes and peppers. So again, this will affect your whole plant and the symptoms should be relatively uniform across the field. So wind or sand blasting. So this can happen when you get a big gust of wind, it picks up soil particles and then it can damage the plants. Um, it sh the whole plant should be affected by this. So it can cause physical damage um, to the young transplants. It's especially common on lighter soils that are picked up by the wind. Um, and the symptoms should be pretty uniform across the field if you're seeing that. Hail injury, um, so this actually happens uh, usually once a season, I can find a field with hail injury. Um, so you're looking for ragged holes in the top of the foliage. Um, you can see the depressed areas on the fruit or sometimes even holes in the fruit. Um, in severe cases, uh, you can get defoliation, you can get some pretty severe lesions and stuff um, happening on the stems, which you can see in the picture there on the bottom right. Um, and sometimes that uh, you can even get secondary infection of these holes um, by other opportunistic pathogens. 
So lightning injury is not as common as you'd think, um, but it does happen. Um, so this will be the sudden appearance of a, of a pretty circular area in, um, in a field. So if you went and scouted that field last week and everything looks fine, and then all of a sudden there's a big circular patch of damage uh, in your field this week, um, then you might wanna look to see if there's some lightning injury. So the leaves at the end of the branches will begin to droop and wilt, and sometimes will die off. Um, sometimes the stem might be caved in or the inside of the stem might be hollow if you were to slice that lengthwise down and look inside. So the next uh, category of disorders we're gonna talk about uh, is disorders on the leaves and fruit. Um, so we're gonna go through a number of different ones here, including leaf roll, blossom drop, um, blossom end rot, sun scald, color, some color disorders, and uh, abnormal fruit development, and then also some fruit cracking. Okay, so we're gonna start off with leaf roll. So leaf roll is usually caused by hot, dry growing conditions. Um, sometimes it can be caused when there's root injury um, from previously waterlogged soil. So the plants are already stressed. Um, certain cultivars of tomato can be more susceptible than others. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. The symptoms of this, uh, the edges of the leaves roll up inward and the leaves may develop like a leathery, tough kind of texture. So blossom drop. Um, so this is uh, this can be caused by a number of different stressors in both tomatoes and peppers. Um, some of them include um, your high temperatures, high soil moisture, or too dry, um, high relative humidity, um, excessive wind conditions. There can also be a symptom of nutrient deficiencies, um, and sometimes it can even be caused by certain diseases and insect damage. So there's a variety of things that could be causing blossom drop. So you really need to be able to look a little bit deeper with this one. Um, so symptoms of blossom drop. So the flower stem and the calyx will turn yellow and the flowers or small fruits will abort and fall off the plant onto the ground. Um, some loss is pretty normal um, in commercial production and especially in peppers. Um, so you will see buds on the ground. Um, it's if that seems to be a little bit heavier than normal, then you might need to look a little deeper and find out what's going on. So blossom end rot is a really common one. You're going to see this in almost every field. Um, so this is essentially a localized calcium deficiency, um, and it always starts at the bottom end of your fruit. Um, so one of the tricky things with blossom end rot is it might not actually be a true calcium deficiency. Um, so this might actually be a result of not enough uh, water. So the root pressure isn't there and the plants aren't able to uptake that calcium from the soils. Um, so the symptoms of blossom end rot, um, these are water soaked or light brown areas at the bottom end of the fruit, which will then darken into these dark brown or even black areas. And a lot of the times you can get secondary infections in there as well um, from opportunistic bacteria or other pathogens. So um, typically blossom end rod does occur at the blossom end of the fruit, but every once in a while you will see um, some atypical um, blossom end rot. And these are just a few pictures of them. It's very uncommon, but it's good to have these kinds of pictures in the back of your mind when you're out there scouting. Okay, another one that's really common and you're most likely going to see in the field at some point in time is sun scald. Um, so this means that the fruit was exposed to the sun uh, and extreme heat. Um, it wasn't covered by the foliage. Um, it can affect leaves and stems. Most commonly we, um, we see it on the fruit. Um, so this is yellow areas where the fruit was exposed to the sun. The areas can then sink and turn light brown in color. Sometimes they're even white. And oftentimes you'll get a secondary infection and that'll be a lot of the black stuff. And then you'll have some fungal growth and whatnot on there as well. All right, so we're gonna move into some color disorders now. So for tomato, we're gonna to be looking at yellow shoulder and um, blotchy ripening, also known as gray wall. And then for peppers, we're gonna be looking at silvering, color spotting and purple striping. All of these are pretty common um, and you can usually find them in a season. Okay, so starting off with yellow shoulder. Uh, so yellow shoulder is usually triggered shortly after the fruit is set. 
and it's thought to be linked to soil potassium and magnesium levels, um, but they haven't really figured out the exact mechanism um, that's causing the yellow shoulder. So the tops of the fruit remain yellow and they don't ripen. Um, they can even remain green, but most of the time it's a yellow color. Um, this ring of yellow tissue around the stem um, and can even penetrate down into the center of the fruit, giving it a tough texture in the middle. So the next one for tomato is blotchy ripening or gray wall. So this is thought to be caused by boron or um, potassium deficiency. It could be caused by excessive nitrogen, high humidity, a variety of different factors. Um, so this one's a little bit tricky. They haven't really figured out what kind of complex is going on that causes gray wall. Um, and it, it, it is quite common to see it. Um, we just haven't been able to figure out exactly what's causing it. Um, so it does have symptoms that are similar to some viruses, so just be careful when you're out there scouting. It's um, mottled green, yellow to red fruit, so a, very vari a variety of colors, very uneven ripening. So there's um, large patches of hard or gray yellow tissue um, in the walls of the fruit, and sometimes the internal, um, if you were to cut that fruit open, the internal tissues will have some brown striping in there as well. So moving on to peppers, so color spotting and peppers. So this is most often associated with cool temperatures. Um, it can also be um, a result of low calcium or you have um, a high nitrogen potassium, like your balance is out of whack. Um, some of the symptoms here is there, they will be small dark spots. So this is a quarter inch diameter or smaller on the pepper fruit. So we're gonna talk about some other color disorders later that are caused by low temperatures that are a little different from color spotting. So it's really important to make sure that you these, these um, circles and stuff that you're seeing for color spotting are gonna be less than a quarter inch in diameter. So silvering. Um, so this is essentially when the outer layer of the pepper, the epidermal cells, separate from the meat of the pepper wall. Um, so this is thought to be caused by environmental factors. Um, if you have uh, thrips damage on your peppers, you can also see similar to this. Um, so make sure that you're looking at your peppers to make sure there's no thrips in your flowers before you determine that you have silvering. Um, so yeah, you get this nice silvered appearance and it ranges from a localized spot and it could cover a good portion of the fruit. So there's a really big variety in there. Purple striping. So this is another color disorder that is caused by cool temperatures. And you'll often see this in uh, coming into the fall in September on some of the fruit that's gonna be your last pick or some of the fruit that's just not gonna mature before the end of the season. So this is patches of purple stripes in severe conditions. It can be the whole pepper. Um, one good thing about purple striping for processing peppers is when these are brought to the plant and pickled, the heat of the pickling process actually can take a lot of this purple striping out and you don't notice it so much in the jar. So that's one benefit of the purple striping. It's not as bad as it looks. Okay, so those are our color disorders. So now we're gonna move on to some abnormal fruit development. So for tomatoes, we're gonna talk about cat facing, zippering and um, puffy fruit. And for pepper, we're gonna talk about blocky or flat fruit. So let's start off with cat facing. So this is often caused by low temperatures during flower de development, so it affects the pollination. So this is actually happening very early on in the fruit development, but you're not gonna notice the symptoms until the fruit are a little bit larger. So the symptoms here, we have scars, or openings on the blossom end. Um, it's, some um, varieties can be pretty severely deformed, and I'll show you a picture of that coming up. Um, so this is often observed in the earliest fruit that's set on the plant. So something to keep in mind. And um, larger fruit varieties like beefsteak tomatoes for fresh market are a little more prone to this kind of cat facing. So as promised, I can show you some extreme pictures of cat facing. So this is an heirloom variety for fresh market that is prone to cat facing. Um, so this is a pretty severe case. You're probably not gonna see this. It'll be a little bit more subtle than that. So moving on to zippering, zippering and cat facing um, can actually be confused a little bit, but there, there is a difference. So zippering is also caused by pollination 
um, issues, but it's not as severe as cat facing. So you're looking for thin brown linear scars that extend from the stem all the way to the blossom end of the fruit. Um, sometimes you'll see openings at the end of the fruit and there may be a scar there as well, but it's not as convoluted as, um, as cat facing. So puffiness in tomatoes. Um, this isn't as common as you would think, but you, you do see it every now and again. So this is actually caused by either extreme heat or extreme cold. So temperatures above 35 or below 13 degrees. Um, so this results in poor pollination. Um, sometimes it's associated with improper nutrition because of the heat or cold stress. And you get this development of flat sides on your tomato fruit. And sometimes on the interior of it, the fruit actually looks almost hollow, like there's nothing in the middle, none of the juice or the seeds or anything like that. And you'll find when you pick up that fruit, it's pretty light compared to a normal tomato fruit of the same age. Okay, moving on to abnormal pepper development. development. So we're going to talk about blocky or flat fruit. So um, this is caused by either cold or heat stress. So cool temperatures, you're looking at 15 degrees in the day or less than five degrees at night during the flower development. And that's another one of these things where the problem actually occurred really early on, but you're not seeing the results of that until much farther down the line in the fruit development. High temperatures can also cause this. So if your daytime temperatures are over 32 or your nighttime temperatures are consistently over 21 for a few days in a row, um, you can get this blocky segmented fruit developing. Um, Again, there's a variety of different extremes there. Uh, most of the time it's just a flattened, a flattened fruit is what you'll see and maybe some extra compartments in there. Okay, so fruit cracking and rain check. So this can happen in tomatoes and peppers. Um, so this is essentially um, when there's a change in the growth rate um, due to temperature fluctuations or sometimes even overwatering. So what happens is you have a fruit that's very warm and then it rains or you irrigate with cold water and then it can um, cause this um, expansion and contraction of the skin of the fruit and then it causes cracks. Um, so there's some pictures there in um, tomatoes and peppers of some large fruit cracks and some more uh, and some smaller fruit cracks that are actually more of the rain check. All right, so we're going to talk about some chemical induced disorders. Now, uh, walnut wilt is pretty common in southern Ontario. Um, fertilizer burn, air pollution, and uh, herbicide industry injury. So what do these kinds of things look like? So the first one is walnut wilt. Um, so walnuts actually produce um, a chemical toxin called juglone in the root system and it can expand quite a ways out from the walnuts and solanaceous crops like tomatoes, peppers, potatoes, eggplants are one of the more severely affected by this juglone and if there's enough of it in the soil it can actually kill the plant. So if you are in an area where there is a walnut or there used to be a walnut within the last few years and it's been cut down, um, you can see this. It usually takes on a circular pattern along with the root system and it can be anywhere up to 10 meters away from where that tree is or used to be. Fertilizer burn. Um, so what causes fertilizer burn? It's usually high salt levels in the roots that can cause this. Um, so you can see the difference in those transplants with the very healthy white root system versus the brown um, dead looking root system. Um, sometimes you can see foliar fix on the leaves and the margins and tips. You'll see a little bit of the fertilizer burn if you're um, applying any foliar fertilizers. So air pollution, um, this does happen, um, just not usually too severely in our area. Um, so these are byproducts of combustion, um, which we use in our vehicles. And um, it can also happen when the barometric pressure is higher than normal. So some of the symptoms, um, you'll see some twisting and distorting of the leaves, wilting, and sometimes even leaf spots. So herbicide injury, 
Um, so I'm not going to be covering too much herbicide injury today. Um, so Darren Robinson from the University of Guelph Bridgetown campus is going to be coming on a little bit later to talk about uh, weeds and herbicide injury. So we're going to get a little more information there. So I'm going to skip this. But if you are looking for more in-depth herbicide injury information on tomato and pepper, head over to Crop IPM and check it out. There's um, a lot of different pictures there of the different herbicides that commonly cause injury for tomatoes and peppers. Some other helpful resources that you might want to check out if you're interested. Um, you can check out uh, Cornell University. They've got a couple um, different documents there, their Vegetable MD and their Diagnostic Key. University of Minnesota has some great resources on tomato disorders, and even the University of Kentucky has some really good resources as well. So if in your spare time, if you're looking for a bit more information, you can feel free to head over and check out the, those resources as well. So that's it for me and the disorders of tomatoes and, and peppers. Um, if you have any other questions, please let me know. Um, you can reach me either by phone, email, or text, and I'll get back to you as soon as I possibly can. So I hope you guys are paying attention because now we're going to move on to a little pop quiz. All right, so just give me a second here and I'll get the... Uh the quiz up and running for you and then we'll use the polling feature here um so <clears throat> and then i will get the slides so you guys can see the actual pictures that i'm referring to in the poll my computer's a little bit slow so i do apologize Okay, so first question. You pretend you didn't see that. You are scouting a field of tomatoes and you notice this damage evenly throughout the crop. What is it? So if you could go onto the poll there and um, select which one you believe is causing the damage in these pictures. Okay, I don't see anyone voting. So are you not able to see the poll? Um, I think we have to submit the whole thing at once. Um, so we can't submit each question. Oh, okay. Well, we'll just have to work with that then. Okay, so we'll find out what you guys thought your um, answer was at the end then. Um, so it was actually hail damage but we'll see what everybody thought it was at the end. Um, okay, so here we have uh, purple striping and peppers. Um, so what causes purple striping and peppers? Check all that apply. Give you guys a couple seconds to do that and then we'll move on. Do, 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 do. Okay, so it's too cold is actually what causes purple striping and peppers. I hope you guys all got that right. And question three, what is this type of damage on tomatoes called? And we'll give you guys a couple seconds to do that one. Alrighty. So that's zippering. And then question four, if you're scouting a field of peppers in early spring and you notice areas of the field where these plants are showing the symptoms here, uh, what is it? Okay, that's chilling injury. And the last question, what is the primary cause of leaf roll in tomatoes? Check all that apply. And then when you're done, you can just submit. And the answer for that one is actually it's too hot or and too dry.
Perfect. Most of you got the guys got the right answers. Great. It's glad to see everybody was paying attention. Okay, so I'm going to stop screen sharing here. And uh, we're going to move on. Um, so to uh, Dr. Cheryl Truman, she's going to be taking over diseases. So Cheryl, whenever you're ready. Sure, I'll just get my uh, screen up here. So all of our quizzes are kind of set up the same. So we'll kind of have to work with that a little bit, Cheryl. That's fine. Okay. There's a way to do it one by one, but I can't yeah, remember. I would have to go back in. <laughs> if and it's a quick fix or not. I, it's not, it's not a quick fix. <laughs> That's okay. So, um, so hopefully you can see my screen now. Uh, welcome to the IPM training. And um, yeah, thanks for coming. So I thought before I got started, I was just curious about how many of you guys are um, are actually crop scouts and how many of you are like doing something else related to crop protection. So if you are if you are a crop scout, can you use your little emo emoticon thing? reaction the reaction button and just do a thumbs up or a symbol of some kind just want to see if you if you are crop skating so at least five of you and the other people either are not or don't know where the reactions button is so that's great okay awesome um okay so so regardless of what your job is, I hope I'm going to, my goal here is to, in a short period of time, just review what some of the most common tomato and pepper diseases are. Um, it says insects and mite pests on the screen too, because I have all my slides in, in one file, but we're just going to do about half of it first. And then Amanda has a quiz prepared and then there's a break. So um, we'll just do diseases first. And, and like Amanda mentioned, we're not really talking about management, uh, here today, but um, my contact information is up here um, and will be on the slides that you uh, can access. And so if you do have questions about management, um, then feel free to get in touch with me. Um, Amanda's available as well as a resource, of course, as well. Um, and I'll say one of the resources that Amanda mentioned was on vegetables.com. And there's some articles up there about some, some management of some of these diseases as well. So take a look, or if you're curious about a specific disease or set of diseases, if you let me know, I can kind of tell you if there's anything up there that we've worked on in the past. Okay, so we'll get started here. And my goal is to maybe spend about 20 to 25 minutes on the slides, and then there's time for a quiz, and then I think Amanda has slotted in some time for questions and answers as well. Um, all right, so we'll get started. Um, okay, so this first slide is just a summary slide um, that I added in this year because sometimes it's hard to remember, is this a problem on tomato, is it a problem on pepper, or both, um, and so that kind of summarizes most of the things occur on both, but some things happen on pepper and not tomato or vice versa. Um, and then I also just put a column in there on like the relative frequency, so this is you know, kind of subjective, but just kind of how often we see it, is it like sporadic or rare or pretty common? Um, just to give you some idea. Um, and how I have my slides organized is we'll cover the actually things in the exact order they're presented in this table from top to bottom. So we'll start kind of with crown and root disease issues and then um, talk about foliage and fruit diseases. And so, and by disease, I mean anything that is caused uh, the root cause is a pathogen, like a living organism. So some of these are caused by fungi, some are caused by oomycetes, some are caused by bacteria um, and, or viruses or nematodes. So uh, first disease is called Verticillium wilt. So this is caused by a fungus and affects tomatoes and peppers. Um, these pictures are from tomatoes. And uh, what you often see with verticillium is kind of V-shaped lesions from, from, the, uh, from the leaf tip. So right there is that V-shape. Um, so you'll see some chlorosis. So that's what we call a yellowing and necrosis, which is where the tissue is dead, so brown tissue. 
Um, and you also will see, because this is a vascular systemic infection, um, some uh, brown vascular tissue, especially at the soil line. Um, so this comes in handy when Amanda had her list of tools you need as a crop scout. Having a knife okay, is very handy so that you can examine the vascular tissue in more detail. <clears throat> um, Verticillium has a very wide host range, actually, so both tomatoes and peppers are affected. Um, in peppers, usually symptoms begin with wilting, so that vascular um, system is plugged, basically with pathogen growth, so you don't have proper movement of water okay, and nutrients to the, of the plant. And so um, this, these photos are from Ontario Crop IPM. You'll see here this is a healthy on the, on the left-hand side. Um, where on the right hand side, you see there's stunting. Okay, we have a poor root system. Um, and you will see on the, the leaves kind of this firing, okay, are more, ne more necrosis, less chlorosis than on tomatoes. Um, so you should monitor for symptoms of verticillium during the growing season. Some plant cultivars uh, will have resistance to some races of verticillium. Um, if you suspect verticillium, it is a good idea to have it confirmed with lab testing. So you can have plant tissue tested for verticillium, but you can also test have the levels in the soil tested as well. Um, for soil samples, those are usually taken um, in, a, in the spring or in the fall. So kind of like May or September, October. <clears throat> Um, another soil-borne issue are nematodes, and I'm not going to talk about nematodes in great detail, but I want you to kind of be aware of them and keep them in the back of your mind. So there's several species of nematodes that can attack tomatoes and peppers, and common, you know, general symptoms include, like, you start to see, like, generally weak areas in the field that just aren't, are underperforming, um, re reduced yield, um, and abnormal root growth. So this could be uh, um, galls and with some types of uh, nematodes. So you see this abnormal root growth, like here, here, here. Um, it could be lesions on the roots, but this, these are pretty um, indescript. Indis so, uh, you know, lots of things could be causing this. Very hard to diagnose. Um, so if you suspect that nematodes can issue, um, you know, the, the sending plant tissue samples or so root samples to the lab for, for diagnosis to determine if there's nematodes present um, is important. You can also, again, do soil sampling in spring or fall for, for nematode populations. Um, there was a graduate student a few years ago who surveyed many uh, tomato fields in Essex and Norfolk counties um, for nematode populations. And so it wasn't in peppers, but a lot of the same land is potentially used for peppers, so also kind of relevant to peppers. Um, so overall, what he found was that nematode levels were generally low, but there were individual fields with high numbers. So it can be really site dependent. Um, if you're monitoring you know, fields over time, comparing populations at similar time of year is important and using the same sampling method is important because the numbers, so, so you have more like a good baseline of numbers. OMAFRA does have recommendations on how to do nematode sampling properly. Um, it's different than other types of soil sampling. Um, and one also other thing to remember in, in the, the field, nematodes are very patchy, um, like their populations are very patchy within a field. So consider where you're taking the samples from. Um, okay. Um, the next disease is called Phytophthora crown and root rot. Um, and so this is caused by a pathogen called Phytophthora capsici, which is an omycete, so a water mold. And um, it is, uh, can be pretty devastating when it's present in a field. And it's soil, soil borne and can survive for many years in the soil. So it's very, very difficult, if not impossible to eradicate from a location. So it's important to know if you have it because it can affect um, a grower's uh, biosecurity plans in terms of trying to limit its spread to other locations. It is present in areas of Essex and Kent. I would say that the presence is, presence is increasing, so we're seeing it in more and more locations. Spreads in soil and, and water primarily. So in peppers, it 
tends, we tend to start to see symptoms in low wet spots. So if you see this pepper field, this is a low spot in the field and all of these are um, dead pepper plants um, that died from Phytophthora counter root rot. Um, so you'll see initially wilting okay, of the plants. So here's an example here. Okay, and then those plants will, will die. The whole plant will, will die and collapse. Um, if you look closer, uh, canker starting growing, moving up from the soil line is very uh, common. Okay, and if you use your knife and look at that uh, vascular system, then you'll see vascular just discoloration, especially in around that canker. Um, this can also occur in tomatoes, but not as common. Like the peppers are probably die the fastest from this disease, but tomatoes can also die or be severely affected. Um, pepper fruit you'll, will also be affected. So they become shriveled up. Um, you might see some signs of the pathogen. So this white mycelial growth, okay. And then also, and also inside um, the peppers. <clears throat> um, in tomatoes, again, like I mentioned, they don't die as quickly, um, but this can still occur. So these are, this is a pot study we did a few years ago where we don't have the, the tomato plants healing over and dying immediately, but you start to see that something is wrong here. So chlorosis of the lower leaves, for example, and moving upward. These are pictures from Essex County, where you, again, you, you see these dead plants. And then in um, processing tomatoes anyway, what we see uh, a lot of is infection of the fruit, where you get the symptoms of buckeye rot. So we'll talk about buckeye rot a little bit later on, but this is it this smooth okay, green fruit with this browning. Um, and then later on in red fruit, signs of the pathogen with this like white mycelial growth. Um, so, you know, and if you're scouting fields where you know that there's phytophthora capsaicea present, I strongly encourage you to think about what biosecurity measures will be put in place to make sure you're limiting the movement to other fields that you might be scouting where this pathogen isn't present. So things like um, washing or disinfecting footwear between fields um, and any tools that may have, have contact with the plant or the soil. <clears throat> Um, the host range of that pathogen also includes uh, other other vegetables like um, all the cucurbits, for example, so cucumbers, pumpkin, squash. There's also other uh, coronal root rots that affect tomatoes and peppers. So this listed some of the pathogens and disease names over here. So I won't spend a lot of time on this, but just want you to be aware that those aren't the only things. And when you start to run into issues where you see um, some kind of root or crown issue, they start to be a bit of a detective and it often requires um, lab tests to really try and start to narrow down what the cause of the problem might be um, or bring in, you know, agronomists or and people like Amanda, and you can talk to me about it as well. Um, and then I'll just point out here the top, we have this like really healthy processing tomato field versus on the right over here, where if you start to see like just a general decline the plants and they're not performing as well, don't forget to look at the root system in your um, scouting endeavor. Okay, so we're going to move on now to you know, some foliar and fruit diseases, and I will start with talking about the three main bacterial diseases. So I'm going to start with bacterial canker, then I'll talk about bacterial spec and bacterial spot. Um, so bacterial canker um, can come in two forms in uh, tomatoes. Um, and so you, have, you can have a primary or systemic infection and a secondary infection. Primary infections in field tomatoes is less common than the secondary infections, but I will talk about it because we, we do see it from time to time. <clears throat> and this picture is actually from, I'm going to say like maybe 2017 or 2018, where we did see some fields that had symptoms of primary canker. The primary canker, um, you may see wilting of plants on one side and kind of just patches of general dieback. So this is pretty like indistinct picture, but if we look closer, this is what you're looking for. Um, so you might see uh, cracking of the, the stem you hear, um, discoloration of the pith tissue near the vessels, um, you know, leading and bidding larger, moving up, um, pith decay you see here, um, and then more advanced pith decay. <clears throat> Um, with secondary in canker, this is something that was more common in the, in the field production. 
um, we see this kind of firing of the leaf margins. So necrosis and, and chlorosis along the edges of the leaf as opposed to lots of lesions in the middle of the leaf or spots in the middle of the leaf. Um, it's usually isolated to the foliage and fruit. So we don't see like that vascular um, decay. The leaflets might start to curl upwards. So you can see that a little bit like here. Um, and then on the fruit, you get these bird's eye spots on the fruit. <clears throat> um, bacterial spec, another uh, foliar pathogen of tomato, not pepper. Um, and you know we see this on foliage and also on the fruit. So on foliage, with these small down brown, like kind of dark chocolate brown lesions, they're usually just a few millimeters wide, um, but they will join together so that eventually that leaf will die. Um, and often, but not always, you'll see a yellow halo. So this area of chlorosis around the, the necrotic area, the dead area that's the chocolate brown color. On fruit, um, we see uh, usually um, lesions are one to three millimeters in size and they'll be slightly raised, like almost like a scab. Like if you cut yourself and you feel that little bit of a bump, and it feels like that. Um, and we shouldn't see any new infections on red fruit. fruit. But I will note, I'm gonna talk about bacterial spec spot next. On the foliage, it's basically impossible to distinguish bacterial spec and bacterial spot symptoms. You can usually distinguish them on fruit, but not on the leaves, <clears throat> unless you, you know, send it for testing at a lab. Um, yeah, so bacterial spot, generally we, we see it uh, more of a problem in Ontario than spec and canker, um, but you know, every year is different. Um, it does enjoy like the more hotter, humid conditions in Ontario summers than bacterial spec, where you tend to see it when the conditions are cooler. Um, so these are, this is an example of lesions on leaves at the top. And then um, below here on the fruit, uh, the lesions tend to be larger than um, spec. Sometimes they will crack um, open um, and sometimes they'll have like a little water soaking around the edge. Initially, they can sometimes be confused with bacterial canker on fruit, like right here, um, but then they'll become um, darker brown in color. So with these foliar bacterial disease pathogens, we see is, you know, joining up of the lesions, and then eventually we start to have premature defoliation. So they're damaging because they're affecting the photosynthetic area of the plant, but also, um, and also contributing to, to damage to the fruit and blemishes on the fruit. Um, on tomato transplants, so we're not really covering greenhouse diseases here, but I put this in because if you are looking at transplants, if you happen to be working for a grower and you're examining the transplants that you pick up from a seedling grower, um, these are things to look for in terms of bacterial spot. On, on transplants. So usually you're not gonna see a tray that's completely covered with bacterial spot, but it could just be like one little spot on a tray, like down here, for example. Um, and if we look closer, again, th these are symptoms of bacterial spot um, that we see on transplants. So at this stage, there's another one here. We keep seeing more. So at this stage, um, you know, this isn't really severe, but once the plants get outside and you get the right environmental conditions, it can spread quite rapidly. Um, these are some kind of environmental or abiotic issue on the leaves. You know, we've, if we've received samples like this or I've asked about samples like this and we've, we've tried to get bacteria out of here, we never find anything. So, you know, this is something that could be easily confused with bacterial spot at the seeding stage. Bacterial spot also affects um, peppers. And with peppers, you'll see um, usually a larger uh, yellow margin or larger, larger yellow halo around the spots. And the other kind of key difference with peppers from tomatoes is that you'll, you'll start to see leaf drop. So you can see if you look hard enough, there's lots of leaves down here that have been dropped from bacterial spot. Okay, I'm not doing great for time here, so I'm going to try and talk less and go a little bit more quickly. Um, okay, so uh, now we're moving into some fungal pathogens, so early blight. Um, with early blight, uh, you'll initially see smaller lesions. They could be potentially confused with bacterial disease, but then they'll get larger. And what you want to especially look like with early blight is the series of alternating rings, which hopefully you can see in these, these close-ups here. 
um, infection on the fruit is not that common. Um, it occurs at the stem end if you if you do see it. So um, symptoms could be confused with blossom end rot, but um, not at the, it's not at the blossom end, it's at the stem end. There are other Alternaria species. So early blights caused by Alternaria bolani. There's other Alternaria species that are a little more um, opportunistic. So they might infect ripe and overripe fruit. And so you can see symptoms that you can use with that, or you get this kind of velvety black um, sporulation. Septoria leaf spot is another kind of sporadic fungal disease, but when it does occur and if the crop is unprotected, you can have quite a bit of defoliation, like you can see in this fungicide, no fungicide picture. With septoria, the lesions are still going to stay quite small um, relative to early blight. <clears throat> um, but what you want to do with a hand lens or a microscope is look at those lesions more closely. And what you're looking at is for a little black um, speck. So those are fruiting bodies of the pathogen where the spores are released. And that's a diagnostic for septoria. Um, and, and then, uh, so early blight and septoria are, are just on tomatoes. Um, anthracnose can occur on tomatoes and peppers. Um, so you can get lesions uh, from of anthracnose on the foliage, but what we're really concerned about is on the fruit. So on tomatoes, it'll almost look like someone pushed in with their thumb, but it didn't pop back out. So you have these little depressions. Um, so initially, these, these small sunken depressions, which will develop into something like this up here. Um, on the right morning, if there's really humid conditions, you may see some pink ooze um, coming out of those, those spots. Um, and then here on peppers, kind of similar uh, scenario. We often see anthracnose developing on peppers that have some called the manda um, Okay, so then late blight of tomato. Um, this is a really aggressive disease. It progresses very quickly. Um, it does not affect peppers. Okay, but it's very serious. So if you're scouting tomatoes, you really want to be on the lookout for this. It affects all above ground plant parts. Um, and contrary to like early blight or septoria, you really see with this kind of greasy looking uh, lesions, they kind of like melting into the tissue. And then the other thing that you are looking for on the foliage down here, especially on a foggy um, wet mornings, dewy mornings, is the signs of sporulation of the pathogen. Um, and this is pretty diagnostic for, for late blight. So if you see something like this or symptoms, lesions that are more like this than like those kind of nice brown, like chocolate brown lesions, you want to be concerned and get it checked out. On the fruit, late blight, um, you know, I heard a, another scientist refer to it as kind of an orange peel texture, which I think is perfect compared to buckeye rot, like with the Phytophthora cassisi and other Phytophthora species. This um, is like an orange peel bumpy kind of texture. <clears throat> um, and so one thing that's happening this year is uh, scientists at Agriculture Canada in Charlottetown, Rick Peters, is collecting an, um, tomato and, and potato late blight samples in 2021 from across Canada. So if you do see late blight, um, please get in touch with either me or Amanda Tracy, and then we can coordinate samples getting shipped to Rick. And what they're doing is just looking at the genetics of the pathogen population. Um, and so why, you know, why is that important from a practical perspective? Um, it comes into play with, because the change, changes in population impacts advice on efficacy of, of fungicides um, and which resistant varieties to use. Um, so, you know, it's about being kind of proactive versus reactive. Also a free method to get late blight confirmed. Um, okay, and then I'll just mention here again, so buckeye rot, I talked about it with Phytophthora capsaicae. There's other Phytophthora uh, species that can also cause this, where it looks maybe similar to late blight fruit rot, but instead of the orange peel texture, it will remain smooth. Okay, and then I'm just going to wrap up here with a few slides on some kind of less common diseases that we see from time to time, depending on the weather conditions. So Botrytis gray mold is one. Um, we have spores of Botrytis like everywhere, okay? But if, so we would just really see it if we have the right environmental conditions, which is usually cool and wet. Um, so you get kind of more of the melting appearance like a, uh, of symptoms. You can have uh, gray sporulation in here. Um, you can see bleaching of the stems we see here. <clears throat> and in those stems, you may see small black little round bodies called sclerotia. On fruit, you get fruit rot, 
and then ghost spots, which occur where kind of infection was stopped, where you get this damaging ghost. <clears throat> Um, on transplants, we see this occasionally as well. This is pepper transplants. <clears throat> we see this like more melting of the tissue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and melting of this leaf tissue here. Um, white mold is something we see from time to time with peppers and tomatoes are susceptible. So it's uh, uncommon. But if you've got a crop with like a lot of foliage, dense canopy, you can get the right conditions, especially if the field has a history of, of white mold on other crops. Um, so soybeans, for example. Um, so again, you see this like really clear bleaching of the stem. You can see here right again. You crack that stem open. You want to look for these overwintering bodies called sclerotia, which is hard-packed mycelium. Okay. Um, so that's what survives in the soil from from year to year. Um, and and you might also see cottony growth here as well. So this is something we tend to see later in the season. Um, there are various viruses that affect tomatoes and peppers. Um, they're not usually a huge issue in field production, but something to be aware of and kind of common symptoms of viruses are the abnormal growth, um, thickened leaves, change in leaf shape, modeling, stunting, and poor fruit set. set you can start to hear, um, think about viruses. Um, there are also powdery mildews. So on peppers, um, powdery mildew is kind of interesting. Um, because on the upper leaf surface, you'll just see general areas of chlorosis starting, especially if you hold it up to the sunlight. Um, the powdery mildew part develops on the underside of the leaf only. We have this kind of whitish gray um, mycelium. That is pretty uncommon in field peppers. Um, powdery mildew in tomatoes is also pretty uncommon in Ontario. Um, here you'll see the, the mildewy growth on both sides of the leaves. You may see uh, bacterial soft rot um, in both uh, tomatoes and peppers. We get these kind of water soaked lesions, slimy, gooey, stinky. Um, this is uncommon unless there's other issues that are caused wounding, so potentially insect feeding damage, for example, um, or if there's a lot of warm wind. All right, so I think that is that's everything for this section. So I'll uh, stop sharing my screen here. And I'll let Amanda take over the quiz. Hi, yes, yeah, I got the quiz here. We'll get this going. Alrighty. So this is a quick, uh, there's only a few questions. So first question. What disease produces these leaf symptoms in tomato? Is it A, septorial leaf spot, B, bacterial speck or spot, C, early blight, or D, late blight? Give you a couple seconds and then we'll move on. Alrighty, the answer is late blight. Next question. What disease produces these tomato fruit symptoms? Is it buckeye rot? bacterial speck or spot? Is it anthracnose or late blight? Give you a couple of seconds and before we move on. Okay, question, it, the answer is anthracnose, those thumbprint kind of looking lesions there. Question three, what disease produces these leaf symptoms in tomatoes? Is it A, septoria leaf spot, B, bacterial speck or spot, C, early blight, or D, late blight? Okay, the answer is C, early blight. Question four, what disease produces these fruit symptoms on tomato? Is it buckeye rot, bacterial speck or spot, Anthracnose or late blight? The answer is A, that's buckeye rot caused by, by oh, bonus points. If <laughs> you can name the pathogen that causes buckeye rot, forgot I put that in there. Put that in the chat if you know the answer. Nobody? 
Not one person knows the what causes buck eye rot. Thank you, Tina, yes. We're almost done, I swear. We're gonna go pee soon. Okay, it is Phytophthora cat's disease. Last question, what disease produces these fruit symptoms and, oh, not last question. What disease produces these fruit symptoms in pepper? Bacterial speck or spot, anthractus, Phytophthora blight, or bacterial soft rot? Give you guys a couple seconds before we move on. The answer is Phytophthora blight. And last one, what disease produces these limb sim leaf symptoms in pepper? Is it verticillium wilt, bacterial spot, phytophthora blight, or viruses? It is bacterial spot. Okay, we do have a few questions or a few minutes for questions if, uh, if you guys have any. Please put them in the chat box there and um, Cheryl and I can address those for you. You guys all did very well on the diseases, by the way. Everybody got the right answers. Okay, well, if you want to start break now, um, I'm going to hang around for a little bit just to see if there's any questions. We are going to come back at, um, what did I say, 10.30? 10.30, and that's when we're going to take up the insects. Um, so if you have any questions throughout the break, put them in the chat and we can, uh, we can address those as they come up, okay? If not, we will see you back here at 10.30. Okay, so hopefully everybody is back. We have about one minute before we get started. Um, so we're gonna be moving on to the insect section. So if Cheryl, you wanna get everything queued up, we can start at 10.30. Sure. Just let me know. Do you just want me to get started now, Amanda? I guess it's not quite 10 30. We'll just wait one more minute. Did you want to? Um, you, you said something in the chat that you might show those pictures before you start on insects? Yeah, sure. So there was a question in the chat about um, for clarification on bacterial spec. Um, they mentioned it only affects um, tomatoes. So this specific, so I guess bacterial spec of tomatoes is caused by a bacteria called. Uh, Pseudomonas syringae pathovirus tomato. So that one affects tomatoes. Um, and to my knowledge, it doesn't cause uh, severe disease on peppers, but there are other Pseudomonas bacteria that can infect peppers. And um, so there was a question like someone had submitted samples from peppers last year and the lab diagnosed it as a bacterial spec. So I'm wondering, I guess I don't know and I haven't seen the report, but I'm wondering one possibility is they might have found. Pseudomon some kind of pseudomonas species and it might have just gotten called bacterial spec because that's what we call pseudomonas on tomato. Um, so, you know, it's not common, but I've seen it diagnosed on peppers before and I'll just show you guys. Uh, these I just added these in during the break, but this is pseudomonas on some pepper seedlings that I've seen before. Um, so, so that gives you kind of what idea, an idea of what I've seen and I know, um, I think Prior to Amanda working at Omafra, the previous uh, tomato and pepper vegetable specialist had seen this maybe before in, in the field before, um, but I think it kind of cleared up um, once the weather got a little bit better. So these pepper seedlings came in uh, to me in a spring where it was like kind of just damp and wet and cloudy, um, which kind of encourages uh, this bacteria. So that's one possible explanation. So I guess my one piece of advice, if you see if you see the results from the lab, sometimes we as crop growers or random we don't always see what the grower sees, but is to ask for a bit more information and you can try and get closer. Um, okay. And yeah, if you have similar questions, you put them into this chat. If I don't see it while I'm talking, then I'll take a look at the chat when I'm done and I can try and 
provide some information that way. Um, okay, so so second part of my my talks today is on um, insects and mite pests. So I did another one of those summary tables, kind of what affects tomato and what affects pepper primarily, and kind of the frequency. And you'll see with the insects, there's a lot of sporadic um, because you know it depends if it's a year for that pest a lot. Sometimes it's site dependent, especially ones that don't tend to travel far and, and um, survive in or survive in soil. Um, and so I, again, I'm going to cover things kind of in the same order that they're um, presented in this table. Um, so first pest is black cutworm. Um, so black cutworm, a kind of a general pest of tomato and pepper and many other uh, crops, usually we see damage in the spring. Um, so like uh, other cutworms, they will curl up when they're disturbed. You see in the upper right here. Um, and they're uh, nocturnal, so they're active at night and they will kind of hide during the day. So often what you can do um, if you suspect cutworm because of the of the damage that you're seeing. So you see there, it's almost like someone took a pair of scissors and kind of snipped the plant off. Um, then if you dig your finger in around here, sometimes you can find the cutworm curled up in the soil. Um, and uh, and so black cutworms, you know, for identification, this is um, kind of a nice little figure um, uh, uh, where you have the head with two black stripes. Um, a greasy kind of appearance and you know pale band along the top of the body along here you see here and paired spots of uneven size um so so the black cutworms have chewing mouth parts and so they'll just kind of chew that almost like i mentioned it's like the transplant or just been cut off um Damage is more likely to be seen in areas that are weedy or near the field uh, edges. Um, because this is where the migratory moths are attracted to to deposit their eggs. Next pest um, is Colorado potato beetle. So this is a pest of, of tomatoes, um, not peppers. Um, many people have seen potato beetles at, at some point. Um, the adults overwinter near field edges um, and then come out in the spring and deposit these eggs. So usually we'll see egg masses on the undersides of the leaves and they're this bright orange color. But, and this picture is kind of out of focus, but I, you know, it's the best one I've had that kind of showed that. Um, and it's out of focus because it was a day when I was out taking pictures where it was kind of windy. So it's actually helping with scouting because the wind kind of like flipped, you can see the underside of the leaves and it was easier to catch those orange masses. Um, and then these are the newly emerging larvae, okay, and then later in star larvae where you can um, more easily see the two rows of black spots on the sides up here in the upper right hand corner. Um, so in Ridgetown we often see egg masses be beginning around the middle of June. Um, so depending where you're located in the province, uh, it might be a little bit later than that. Um, and there's several uh, uh, instars of the potato beetles. They're slow moving as well. Um, so they're not going to run away really fast. They're not particularly difficult to scout for um, compared to some insects. And these have chewing mouth parts, so they're going to defoliate the plants. Um, so these are the adults, uh, and the adults are pretty distinctive. Um, they've got 10 black stripes on the wings um, across here. Uh, and so we're most concerned in tomatoes about early season damage. Uh, you see this transplant here that's had most of its leaves chewed off. So this is where the most economic damage is going to occur because it's harder for these plants to recover. Um, this is really severe infestation um, in these older plants from a research trial that we had a few years ago. Um, and they'll even start, you know, if they get desperate, they'll start eating like the stems and the fruit. I, but I would say foliage is where they would head first. There are thresholds established for potato beetles in Ontario. Um, they've considered half an adult or larvae per plant in the first two weeks after transplanting. And after that, when the plants are better established, then um, they one adult or larvae per plant later in the season. Um, next best is wireworms. Um, and so 
wireworms, you know, you may, if you've scouted other crops, then you may have scouted for wireworms before. Um, so there's these thin um, copper colored uh, larval stage of, um, of click beetles. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're actually counting wireworms though. So you look at uh, these for three pairs of thoracic legs, you've seen this red circle here. There shouldn't be any other legs, so no pro legs like you see in the caterpillar, like the fat stubby ones on the abdomen. Um, and you wanna make sure you don't confuse them for other soil dwelling organisms like a millipede. You see here and the millipedes got lots and lots more than three pairs of thoracic legs. So you kind of see it here, right here. Um, and the damage of wireworm, this is damage on pepper. You see feeding just on the stem here, um, kind of right at the soil line. Um, and we've got mother picture here of this is damage on tomato transplant um, from a research trial we did last year. Um, so you see the plants kind of starting to wilt. <clears throat> Um, and then digging around just right, right at the soil line, just under the soil is where this damage occurred. And then if you're lucky, you might even find the culprit right there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot we don't really understand about monitoring for wireworm. Um, I've talked to some of the entomologists that have done some of the wireworm research in field crops. Um, and, you know, there's different bait traps so you can do bait stations in the spring or fall to try and establish um, you know, what the population is, but you can say like, we did some work on wireworms last year, we were trying to evaluate some insecticides and we thought we had a pretty good population and then we really didn't see that, that much damage. We saw a little bit, but not a lot. So, um, you know, you can do bait stations to determine what the level of population is, but I don't think we really know what those numbers really mean in tomatoes and peppers in terms of um, the risk yet. Um, we do see this more of an issue in sandy fields, especially on sandy knolls, knolls or where there's been a history of, of issues. So um, that's another thing to consider if there's a soil type. <clears throat> um, variegated cutworm is another, so this is a, a Lepidopteran pest, a caterpillar um, in tomatoes. Um, and this is usually a pest that comes in later in the season, like so in July, for example, excuse me. Um, so you see the variation in the, the color, um, but what, what is consistent is, you know, head with kind of this dark brown net-like pattern um, and, you know, these whitish or yellow spots along the middle of the back. Um, damage you see uh, on the fruit, for example, and this is the frass, the insect poop you can see here. So sometimes you might see this poop and feeding damage before you might see the actual cutworms. Um, they can also damage the foliage. So there's an example right here, a scattered leaf feeding. Um, so one thing you can do, you know, is search that fruit. If you see fruit like that, you cut that open um, carefully and examine it for, for what larvae or what insect it might be. Um, so usually it's a migratory population that comes into Ontario and deposits eggs. Uh, occasionally they can overwinter kind of in the extreme southwest of Ontario if it's a warm um, winter. <clears throat> so again, these are like the other cutworms nocturnal, so they feed at night, climb up from the plants, so they'll curl up in this fruit <coughs> or soil during the day. Sorry, I just got to take a sip of water. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> And so because it's a migratory population, there are um, traps available to trap the incoming moss, kind of determine when risk is highest. Um, so these are usually installed by late June to make sure you catch, you know, in case there was an early flight. Um, there's lots of instructions on installation and monitoring on, listed in Ontario crop OPM. So I'm not gonna cover that today. Um, next is cabbage looper. So cabbage looper can be occasional um, pest of tomatoes, it's fairly minor, um, but could cause issues depending on when they first appear. Um, so you see um, they have these large ragged um, holes eating the, the leaves. Um, and the, the looper itself is smooth, kind of a pale green, with these thin white line along each side and um, two faint lines in the center. So this is the two faint lines, okay, and then this is the thin line on each side of the body. And we'll move like, an inchworm. Okay, so you have this motion like this coming up. 
Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, when scouting, you want to look for feeding damage, check the undersides of the leaves, you know, look for, for flats and feeding damage. Um, it's rare for them to eat the fruit, but they could go in if it's already damaged by something else. Um, recently, uh, especially in Essex County, they've also discovered that there's other loopers species um, that you can't distinguish from cabbage looper, uh, just based in, on the, in the field. The, the, appearance of the larvae look almost exactly the same, so they're indistinguishable unless you have special training. Um, so these are probably migrate in from the U.S. And there's tomato looper and soybean looper, um, and there's some entomologists that are doing more work on this. Um, there's some, something to be aware of. Um, a few years ago, you know, I was in some late season processing tomatoes in Essex County, and we saw quite a bit of damage from these, and there's probably not cabbage looper, but these other loopers. Um, at this stage, it wasn't really economic because they were just prior to harvest, but something to keep in mind and to notice. And you see here the early instar larvae are actually causing this kind of window painting damage instead of the large ragged holes that we see later on. And then this is an example of frass. <clears throat> Another lepidopteran pest is tomato fruit worm. So this is one that you might see fed tomatoes along with variegated cutworm. So these can vary in color. Okay. Um, it's the same insect as the corn earworm, but in tomatoes, the common name is tomato fruit worm. Okay. Um, so you get the, the double stripe here, and they can range in color from kind of a pale green to pinkish brown. Again, you, you'll see the image on fruit. Again, if you cut that open, you can look for the, the perpetrator. Um, tomato and tobacco hornworm are kind of, I guess, if you've grown tomatoes like in your backyard, you know. Um, they're fairly common. They're not so common in kind of conventional tomato production. Even the insecticides used for other pests will, will knock these out, but you do see them uh, occasionally. Um, so these are these really, really large um, caterpillars up to eight centimeters <clears throat> um, long. And uh, the tomato and tobacco hornworm are, are very similar. Um, the tomato will have these eight V-shaped marks. <clears throat> um, on its body, so that's one of them there, and and the, on the tobacco, it's these diagonal markings, <coughs> um, with this little spike on the end. Let's see here, and here, um, and these are kind of funny. I always tell my students at Richdown when I used to teach about this that you know they kind of blend in really well with the foliage at first. So if you look really closely, you'll notice that they do eat quite a lot of foliage, but the caterpillars themselves are going to be initially hard to find until you like find one, then you start finding more. But once when several years ago, I was pretty busy with work and it was working pretty late. So I wasn't really paying attention to my tiny backyard garden. And then I was looking out the window in the basement and I thought like, I just noticed that my tomato plants were turning like they've lost so much foliage. And my husband was supposed to be watching them and, and watering them. And so I like ran out there taking a look there was hornworms like everywhere he's like oh i didn't notice like how could you not notice this but um he doesn't have a crop scouting background and probably would get fired but um uh he anyway they can blend in really well so we picked off probably like a dozen from four plants already and they will start to feed on the fruit um eventually like fall fruit. um one thing that's kind of neat to see and is a good sign if you do see these um these little white Okay, or things, structures poking out from the hornworms is that's a beneficial wasp that's actually um, using uh, the hornworm as a food source for it. So that's kind of neat um, and a good sign. So that guy's not gonna, gonna make it. Um, and then the European corn borer. Uh, so this is primarily a pest of, of pepper. pepper. Um, and uh, what the egg masses, so this is which were taken from corn, but they're kind of fish scaly, um, you see here. And then the larvae will enter the pepper fruit um, uh, under the calyx. And you can sometimes see these entry areas where there's be like sawdust, like frass um, on the pepper fruit. Um, and then they will feed inside the fruit. Okay, and so it might be hard to discover. But of course, once a consumer has this, then there's pretty much zero tolerance because 
no one except me and other cool people like you guys would find it cool to cut open your pepper and find a, a corn blur inside. This is actually a corn blur that I found in a pepper fruit that I bought from a grocery store. You can see it right there, but you can see some of the damage that, that happened. Um, and so, you know, corn blur populations in the field have generally dropped in recent years. Um, but um, you can monitor for corn borer uh, using milk carton or um, uh, sticky cards, or there's also these um, heliothis traps. So there's more information on how to use these on Ontario crop IP. And the, the corn borer itself, I guess I forgot to describe it, it's basically about an inch long, it has this greasy appearance, um, a dark head, and then any spots on each side of it. Um, because this is also a pest of, of field corn, um, there is the field crop entomologists um, and others at OMAFRA have worked with people in other provinces to develop like a Great Lakes and Maritimes monitoring system for some of the important lepidopteran pests, including black cutworm <coughs> and European cornworm and corn earworm. Um, and so uh, this is kind of useful because they're just tracking um, the population, like the moth-like populations these areas. So there's more information if you follow this hyperlink when you get these notes. Um, but basically it means that there'll be kind of real-time maps posted during the growing season of what's happening. And so you can kind of direct your scouting that way. Um, so that may be of interest to you. <clears throat> um, okay, next uh, pest is a two-slotted spider mite. And this is usually um, can be a pest um, especially in hot and dry seasons. So it's something to keep an eye out for if we aren't getting a lot of rain. Um, usually there's enough moisture that falls naturally to kind of keep the population in check um, from uh, natural enemies um, and like fungi that colonize the mites, et cetera. Um, so one good thing to do is to just pay attention to if there's mites no noticed in other crops, for example, like soybean, um, then that kind of heightens your awareness to be a close lookout um, in vegetables. Um, so some really, uh, you know, symptoms of two feathered spider mite feeding damage is kind of the stippling you see here. Um, it start off initially at, like not quite so severe. Um, and then bronzing, because you can kind of see down here. Um, more advanced, you may see webbing. Um, and the spider mites themselves are really small. So Best, you can see them with the naked eye kind of running around they're like with like little dots, um, but best seen with a hand lens when you're first learning for sure. Um, if you discover uh, spider mice, then um, you want to avoid kind of spreading them to other fields or spreading them within the field. You kind of scout, avoid that area or scout that area last um, and then change your clothes before you go to another field because they will get on you. Um, and then, you know, you can deposit them somewhere else by accident. Um, and often we'll see spider mite damage starting kind of on a field edge and then kind of moving inward to the field. So you kind of see here. <clears throat> so this is, you know, you see something like this, you're gonna investigate further because a lot of different things from the road. Um, okay, next group of pests are stink bugs. Um, so there's, uh, you know, these can affect tomato and pepper um, and can cause significant issues when they're severe. Uh, you know, we don't have a good understanding in Ontario. We don't think of which stink bug species are most important in terms of being damaging. Um, brown and green stink bugs are at least thought to be two of the ones that, are, that cause economic damage. So these are photos of green, uh, brown stink bugs. So this is the adult over here, the adult, and then the nymph stage or the immature stage. They kind of look like tiny versions of the adult um, without any functional wings, kind of more of a, a curved uh, a shape. I always kind of think that stink bug nymphs look kind of cute. But uh, what's not cute is when they're feeding with their piercing sucking mouth parts um, on the fruit. So they're not gonna be chewing, okay, removing or defoliating, but they're piercing, sucking damage on the fruit of the pepper tomato is what's causing the damage. Um, and both the, the nymph stage, that immature stage and the adult stage will do this. Um, this is green stink bug, okay? Um, and then the nymphs, kind of a different, a slightly different coloration. Um, so the damage looks like on tomato, um, the damage will appear slightly differently depending on whether the fruit was fed on when it was green or or red. So on red fruit, you get kind of these cloud spots and it's gonna be hard for you to see probably on your screen, but kind of these like little spots here. And then when you 
cut that open, um, you'll see this damage underneath in here as well. Um, so this is one of what you want to avoid it, like with processing tomatoes, because it, once it's peeled, then you'll see these white marks on the discoloration. With feeding on green fruit, you can get these, you know, it's not that apparent, it's more like a ghost spot on the green fruit, but when, as it ripens, you get almost, it almost looks like snowflakes. And then um, there's some damage underneath the peel, but it's not as apparent as when the feeding's on red fruit. And then on pepper, again, you know, this would probably be some right here. And then once you, you slice that open, get these um, discolorations there. Um, it is important to be aware, you know, stink bugs have this kind of standard shield shape of the adult okay, on their back. Okay, these are the wings that are overlapping into an X pattern. Um, but there's also stink bugs out there that are um, beneficial. And so, you know, I'm not going to talk about it too much today about getting to know your natural enemies, but it is to, to be aware, like if you see an insect as a crop scare, it doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. So just be curious and try to find out like what you're seeing. Is it a pest or maybe it's something that's good or maybe it's something that's kind of neutral. But with stink bugs, um, there are some predatory stink bugs that will actually feed on pests like Colorado potato beetle larvae, for example. And so I, I won't explain this too much here today, but you can try and kind of distinguish that based on the shape of their mouth parts. But there's this field guide to stink bugs that's kind of handy and has a lot of good images. If you look at the, the notes from this presentation, this is hyperlinked, so you can um, download a copy of that. Plant bugs will also cause similar damage as stink bugs. So um, they're in the same insect order as, as um, stink bugs. They're very really smaller, and, but they still have this kind of X shape on their back of the adults. This is a nymph over here, and these will feed on lots of different um, plants. Um, but research has shown that the stink bug, like the Harris plant bugs, does not prefer tomato. Um, I'm not sure about pepper, but stink bugs really prefer tomato versus um, Harris plant bug. <clears throat> And again, if you're interested in um, intensive scanning for stink bugs, um, this is a summary of like the method that is required <laughs> um, from research done by Celeste Welty at Ohio State. Um, it is very intensive. And so a lot of times um, it's just not, hasn't been proven to be practical um, because of the um, amount of time that it takes. But generally in Ontario, we start to see stink bugs moving into tomatoes and other crops after the wheat's been taken off. Mid to late July. <clears throat> um, there is also an invasive stink bug, brown marmorated stink bug, um, that's now established in, in nearby US states and near overwintering populations in Ontario. Um, and, you know, there's information here about how to distinguish it from other stink bugs. So it's got a similar shape as white bands on the antennae, um, white triangles along the abdomen, abdomen and smooth shoulders. And you see like this middle arrow. Um, and the, you know, it, the damage is kind of similar to other stink bugs, but I guess the big issue is it's even more damaging because you can see multiple nymphs here congregating on these fruit and causing pretty severe damage. So um, that's something that people are keeping an eye on. <clears throat> Um, aphids uh, can be an occasional pest in field peppers and tomatoes. We certainly don't see them to the same degree as what we might see in greenhouse production. Um, so oops, uh, generally aphids, uh, when they're wingless, we're looking for their tailpipe. So their cornicles at the base of the ad abdomen sticking out. Um, this, they also come in winged form. So this is a winged form right here. So pear shaped generally with the, the cornicles or tailpipes at the end. They will produce honeydew, so this shiny substance, so that's another sign to look for. Um, and this is an aphid cast, so that's from their molt. Um, so that is something else that you may see in the field. Um, but one thing that to also keep an eye out is we do have um, parasitic wasps that will deposit eggs in the aphid and their larvae will grow inside there and then they turn into an aphid mummy. Um, so that's something that's good to see um, if you're supporting kind of natural enemies in the field. And if you're scaring soybeans, you might see these as well with sweet. Um, sap beetles are something that we see occasionally, especially on rotting fruit or overripe fruit. So they're attracted to that damaged fruit. So, so you know, just a minor pest, but something you might see in the field. Um, okay, and then I think we've got two more pests here for, for peppers. So pepper maggot. So um, 
And I guess I didn't put all my speaking notes like on the slides today. So when Amanda sends out the, um, my slides, hopefully you'll see the notes pages as well, which will have some of these more details that I'm talking about. Um, so peppermint gets pretty rare and really only been seen kind of in the extreme southwest, so think of like Essex County. But basically, um, the, it's a fly, uh, so the, the eggs are deposited in the wall of the pepper fruit, and then the maggot feels, feeds within the fruit, um, and then, you know, exits, pupates in the soil, and then adult develops. So there's just one generation per year. It usually, this leads to soft rot because of the damage to the, to the fruit. So the larvae are um, just about a centimeter uh, long, legless, okay, and white. Um, they can be monitored um, with yellow sticky traps that are baited with ammonia, uh, but just not very common. Um, another pest, if you're scaring peppers, that you should be aware of, though, is pepper weevil. Um, and this was pretty widespread in 2016 and, and 2017 um, in both greenhouse peppers and field peppers. Um, the good news is that it was, has not been found in field peppers in 20, 2019 or 2020. Amanda has been doing um, a monitoring program for the last several years. Um, so that's really good news, but why don't you keep an eye out for it because I'm sure Amanda would really want to know if it is found as well as all the pepper growers, <laughs> okay? So um, it's very destructive and it's very difficult to manage because it spends most of its life inside the pepper fruit. So the adults deposit um, eggs in the, the fruit wall and then the larvae feeds internally and pupates internally and then the adult exits um, um, out of the hole and then they mate and then deposit more legs. And they have several generations that are overlapping per year. Um, so you see the adult um, here, okay, larvae, and then the, the pupil stage. And what distinguishes again of the weevil is this a concentration from other weevils that look very similar. It's this concentration of, of white hairs, but they are difficult to identify. And um, you know, people have made mistakes in the past. So if you suspect that you've got weevil, I would say, you know, contact Amanda and ask her to confirm just to make sure. Um, so the larvae are anywhere from one to four millimeters long, and those will be found in the fruit. The weevil, the adults, can be they're black or dark brown or dark amber and range from about two and a half to four millimeters. So still very small. Okay. Um, so this is some of the, the uh, damage. Um, for pepper weevils, uh, as you see here, you know, the pepper fruit are rotting. The calyx, when it turns yellow, is an indication that there may be mature larvae or, or pupae present. Okay, and then the exit holes, of course, and then you get all these soft rots and it's unmarkable. Um, okay, so this is some of the damage or some of those locations where you might find the weevils on the plants, but they are difficult to find. Um, uh, there's look like small dots on the foliage. There are pheromone traps that can be used for um, peppy, pepper weevil, so it's a double-sided sticky trap to catch the adult used with this two-component pheromone lure, which is critical to use properly um, and to change the sticky traps as often as possible um, because you can see all of how polluted they are with other insects okay, and soil and stuff, and then that allows uh, help as contributes to the weevils being able to escape from the, the traps. Um, so if you want more information about trapping, I would also talk to Amanda because she was um, kind of busy. Okay, so I'm going to stop talking. I think I probably talked for too long, and um, I'll turn it back over to Amanda. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so we're going to get a quiz going here, and uh, while I'm doing that, I'm just going to do a quick plug-in um, for some of the research projects we got going on this year on some uh, damaging insects. Um, so we actually are doing a pepper maggot monitoring program um, because we think there might have been a range expansion. So maybe next year in this course, we'll have something to update on pepper maggot. And then the other thing is if you're out in tomatoes this year and you happen to see some Colorado potato beetle, there's a researcher in Guelph that's looking for samples of Colorado potato beetle, um, adults, larvae, they'll even take some eggs. So if you wanna give me a call, if you find any, I'll come out uh, right away and we'll be able to collect some samples from that site and um, send them off and help this researcher out. Um, she's looking at ways of, of disrupting mating. Um, so that's really interesting. And um, 
please keep an eye out for that. Okay, so our insect quiz here, let's get started. So first insect, what insect pest is this? Mainly in tomato, but it can also be seen in pepper. Is it A, tarnished plant bug, B, aphid, C, Colorado potato beetle, or D, stink bugs? We'll give you guys a couple of minutes or a couple of seconds to answer that one. Hopefully it's an easy one. It is stink bugs. Next question. Question number two, what insect pest is this? It is found in tomatoes and peppers. Is it loopers, cutworms, hornworms, or wireworms? Give you a couple of seconds on that one. Okay, it's cutworm. That's black cutworm there in the picture above, on the top. Question number three. What insect pest is this? It is found in both tomatoes and peppers. Tarnished plant bug, aphids, Colorado potato beetle, or stink bugs? The answer is aphids. And question four, what insect pest is this? It's found in both tomatoes and peppers. Is it loopers, cutworms, hornworms, or wireworms? The answer is it's a wireworm. And final question, what insect pest is this? It is found in only tomatoes. Tarnished plant bug, aphids, Colorado potato beetle, or stink bug? The answer is Colorado potato beetle. Okay. We can move on now to our weeds section. If Darren is on, there you are. Hello everyone, how are y'all doing today? Very well, thanks. How are you, Darren? <laughs> Good, all right. So you can uh, start sharing your screen and uh, get started whenever you are ready. Is that uh, is that showing, Amanda? Yep, looks good. Okay. All right, everyone. So I'm going to talk um, a, a bit about weed control, more from the context of talking about the herbicide injury, because because the the purpose of the meeting is to talk about scouting training, um, but when you're using herbicides, you're not only looking for the injury that they cause. Sometimes you're also looking for the, the weeds that escape those herbicides and, um, and need a, uh, a follow-up application of a herbicide. So I will talk about a little bit about weed control only in the context of what you have to do as a, a crop scout. And then I will focus on the main weed species that are uh, the primary, the annual weed species that are an issue in uh, processing tomatoes and peppers. <clears throat> Okay, so in order to do that, I, I'll introduce the herbicides that are used primarily. And, and again, I'll focus on what they're weak on and where we're likely to, to see injury. I mean, the main reason growers use these two herbicides, Dual and Sencor, um, with the Dual, you're getting grass control and you're getting control of Eastern Black Nightshade. With Sencor, you're getting control of most of the broadleaf weeds that are out there. Um, probably the main weakness that we have associated with the, the pre-plant incorporated herbicides is that if we're working on a low organic matter soil, 
Um, and we get some, some cool wet conditions for say a, a week or so after transplanting that can set transplants back. And you may notice the transplants simply that they don't move at all. Another, in, in terms of the weed weakness, the main weakness that we see with these two herbicides is that Sencor, which is a triazine herbicide, will not control triazine tolerant weeds. Um, the two main weed species that we're concerned with are lambs, quarters, and, and pigweed in terms of triazine resistance. And um, when it comes to triazine resistant lambs, quarters, most fields in Ontario have them at, at least in a portion of the field. So it's very likely you're going to see lambs, quarters, and pigweed escaping even though these two herbicides have been applied. Okay, in terms of the injury symptoms, dual moves in the shoots. And if we have those conditions that I was talking about, so we have cool wet soil conditions, um, dual can cause some, uh, some leaf distortion, some, some leaf curling. It may also cause the midrib to shorten a little bit and you'll get what looks like a heart-shaped leaf, and, and that's what we're, we're showing over here, where the, uh, the midrib gets, uh, pulls the, the outer edges of the, the leaf inward and makes it look heart-shaped. You'll also get some chlorosis that goes along with that. <clears throat> okay, that's what dual injury looks like. The, the other herbicide that is going to be typically applied along with dual, first thing in the growing season, is Sencor, okay? Sencor, unlike dual, where you see the injury in the new growing tissues, Sencor, you're going to see the injury in the older leaves. And what that will look like is yellowing in between the leaf veins. Uh, so if you hear the term intervenal chlorosis, that's what they're talking about, is, is yellowing in between the leaf veins. But it will show up on those older leaves rather than on the, uh, the newer leaves like, uh, like dual does. Okay, so... Again, dual and Sencor are the two main herbicides that are being used um, prior to, to transplanting. There are some growers that will include Treflan, and I've actually had quite a few questions about bringing Treflan back into the mix or bringing Prowl into the mix. Okay, And the reason I mentioned Prowl, it's a relatively newer registration that we have in the province, but Prowl and Treflan uh, work by the same mode of action. So they can cause some of the same injury symptoms. So when I talk about the injury symptoms you can get from Treflan, we can see those same things with Prowl. And um, you may see, you, you may be uh, working with some growers that are including Prowl in their uh, pre-plant incorporated uh, pre, uh, herbicide program. Treflan um, is, is again, it's, it's an older herbicide. It's being used by a few growers. I, I don't think you're going to see it as much, but again, I'll talk about it because injury looks like Prowl. Probably the main benefit of including either Treflan or Prowl along with Dual and Sencor is that it will give us, say about three to four weeks of control of those triazine resistant weeds, lambs, quarters, and, uh, and pigweed. It's not gonna control those weeds later in the season. So through, um, you know, through the months of July and August, you might start to see uh, red root pigweed and uh, lamb's quarters escaping after that. Um, so it's going to help with residual broadleaves. Treflan is mostly a grass herbicide, but it does give some broadleaf control. The biggest concern that I have with Prowl being used now, and this is based on uh, the experience that we've had with Treflan, is that if we have really, really shallow planted transplants, so let's say you know, in, in certain parts of the field, the transplant only gets set down half an inch or, or even an, an inch deep, you may see some injury with prowl, um, especially if we have really, really cool wet conditions and we get a real heavy rain event. So a, a three or four inch rain event. Another concern that I have with this is when we tank mix Treflan Dual and Sencor, we have to bring the dual rate down. If we're gonna follow the, the, the label, what's, what's registered on the label, we have to drop the dual rate down. And remember, even though dual, like I said, is, is, it's mostly there for grass control, it also gives us control of Eastern Black Nightshade. When we tank mix these three together, and I've seen this when I've tank mixed Prowl with Dual and Sencor, 
um, we get less residual control of eastern black nightshade. So you might start to see more eastern black nightshade um, escapes. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about a herbicide called Authority. Authority is being brought in to help us handle or was, was registered to help us handle eastern black nightshade. But I, I see that as a weakness uh, with Treflandul and Sencor. And if we have some growers that are opting to use Prowl with Dual and Sencor, I do think that, um, or I know we will see less residual control of Eastern Black Nightshade. All right, so again, when we uh, use these three together, the main escape that, uh, that we'll get will be um, Eastern Black Nightshade. If it's heavy, if a field is heavily infested with it, not every field is, but those that have Eastern Black Nightshade typically have uh, really high weed pressure for, for that species. <clears throat> Okay, and the type of injury symptoms to look for, there's a few different things. And, you know, a lot of this goes along with the environmental conditions that are occurring at the time that, um, that the injury is being experienced. So you will see definitely a reduction in root growth. So what you're seeing here, three, uh, three transplants, the one in the middle did not have any uh, treflan. Uh, in it, it was just Dual and, and Sencor. The two plants on either side did have a tank mix of Treflan, Dual, and, and Sencor all together. The reduction in root growth that we see, and you'll also see uh, what's it's called club rooting. If you look really, really carefully at the tips of the roots, you'll see the tips of the roots are actually a bit swollen. Um, but you'll see that a reduction in root growth. At the same time, often, not always, often you'll get uh, purpling of the leaves. And that's associated with cool temperatures. It's not just the, the Treflan injury. And the fact that because we have reduced root growth, the plant can experience some phosphorus deficiency. Um, so I think what you're seeing there is a, a combination of uh, cool weather conditions and some, some phosphorus deficiency because the root system is impacted. And again, um, this, this same type of injury I do think can happen with Prowl together with Sencor and Dual. So, so be mindful of that because I know that there are some people that are, are looking to try it um, as a tank mix combination. If we have relatively good weather conditions, I don't see any injury whatsoever. But if we're working on a, a low organic matter soil, less than, than 2% organic matter, and we get a real heavy rainfall, so say a three inch uh, rainfall event, I do think we can see this type of injury if, if we have cool wet conditions. <clears throat> All right. And this was really borne out by some trial work that was done. This is quite a, a number of years back where they looked at the effect of transplanting depth on injury and subsequent yield loss when Treflan, Dual, and Sencor were applied on a very, very sandy soil, right? So what you're seeing here is yield loss as a percent of the, the plants that have been set at four inches deep, where in the, the, the four inch deep uh, transplants, there was no injury, no, no yield loss compared to the, the untreated check. And then gradually in, in increments up to where the, the transplants had been set just beneath the soil surface, there was some pretty significant injury and yield loss, right? Over 30% yield loss. That's well, really, that's uh, not acceptable. So one of the things to be, to be aware of if you're diagnosing injury symptoms from, uh, from pre-plant uh, pre incorporated herbicides is to dig up the plants and look at how deep the transplants have been set. <clears throat> okay, probably the main mainstay of, uh, of, of herbicide programs that are being used out there uh, growers will use dual and Sencor, and they'll follow it up with post-emergence applications of Sencor. Um, like I said, growers are starting to incorporate Prowl into their tank mixes, and they're starting to incorporate Authority. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but most of the growers are going to deal with, this is what they're doing. Main advantage is that with those post-emergence Sencor applications, um, we do see some improvement in other broadleaf weeds uh, and control of other broadleaf weeds like velvet. So you're less likely to see weed escapes later in the season. Um, by splitting out the, the Sencor applications, so often another thing that they'll do when they, they, 
use this sequence of, of herbicides is that pre-plant incorporated application of Sencor, they'll drop the Sencor rate down a little bit um, to offset the fact that they're applying the, the post-emergence Sencor. And that does reduce the chance of, of injury if we have really cool wet conditions, uh, again, right after transplanting. The main weakness still, this, you're relying on Sencor to control broadleaf weeds and you're not going to get control of triazine resistant lambs, quarters or pigweed. So you're going to have to come back in with some sort of post-emergence treatment. Um, and, and so it's likely that you're going to see lambs, quarters and, and pigweed escape. All right. So again, this is overall the most consistent herbicide uh, treatment that uh, that we've looked at in our trials, and we did these trials over many many years at uh, a number of locations where dual and Sencor are applied, preplant incorporated, and and followed by post emergence applications of Sencor. And in for the most part, this is you're going to see some sort of variation on this theme in the growers fields that uh, that you're working. All right. When they're making those microarray applications, as much as possible, if you're doing your scouting, this is the size of the weeds. So these are some, uh, well, there's a couple of lambs quarters in here and there's a, a velvet leaf. So the lambs quarters are these, these plants here with the, the long uh, elongate oval cotyledons and the velvet leaf is, is up at the top there with those heart-shaped cotyledons. Um, this is the size that really those, post-emergence applications of Sencor need to be being applied. If you're scouting a field and you see weeds that are at this stage, it's very likely in the real sandy portions of the field that have, have warmed up, the weeds are going to have about two or three uh, weeds on, uh, leaves on. And um, th this is the, the stage that we really need to target those microarray applications of Sencor. So if you're doing scouting for um, for a grower to, to help them plan their, uh, the, their herbicide applications. This is the size and, and the stage of the weeds that, that you want to, to be making those applications at. <clears throat> All right. And again, the reason that growers do this, uh, where they go dual plus Sencor and then follow it up with post-emergence applications of Sencor is that this reduces, the, this has the, the most consistent level of reducing weed populations in the field. Right, um, just dual and Sencor by itself without any post-emergent Sencor or just the three-way tank mix, whether it's Treflan dual Sencor or Prowl dual Sencor will not give you as consistent a control of broadleaf weeds in, uh, in tomatoes. And um, you're likely to see escapes of, in particular, um, lamb's quarters and also uh, velvet leaf to some degree Red root pigweed, and then um, with the again with the that three-way mix, whether it's Treflan dual Sencor or Prowl dual, dual Sencor, you will see more escapes of Eastern Black Nightshade. Okay, so again, the that sort of dual Sencor preplant incorporated followed by Sencor is what most of the growers are going to be doing that uh, that you're working with, and they will be doing some variation on. Um, likely they'll be using a herbicide called Prism uh, to help out with, with some of the other weeds that I'll talk about, or the, or, and they'll also be using uh, a grass, a post-emergence grass herbicide to help pick up any grasses that, that might escape that treatment. Okay, so I mentioned authority, and authority herbicide is a more recent registration. Growers are starting to develop some familiarity with it. Some growers are happy to use it. Other growers are a little bit reluctant because they don't have a lot of experience yet. So right now, you guys are working with growers, the, the entire growing population that's in a little bit of a, a transition phase. All right, the reason authority is such a benefit for the growers is that it will control triazine resistant red root pigweed and lamb squirters, right? It, it really does help out with those and it does improve our control of Eastern black nightshade. Um, you have to use the, the high rate that's, that's on the label to, to get that, um, but uh, it's, it's really beneficial for that reason. <clears throat> okay, one thing when you're scouting fields to be mindful of 
any herbicide has the potential to cause injury to the crop, right? It is, it is a stress on the crop. In most situations that I've worked with authority, it's been really safe, right? It hasn't had any impact on injury, hasn't, hasn't delayed maturity, and hasn't reduced the yield. <clears throat> okay. And I've also worked with incorporating authority into that standard mix of dual and Sencor, and then followed it up with applications, with post emergence applications of Sencor. And it has a really good fit. Like I said, it will give us control of those trizine resistant lambs, quarters, and pigweed, and will improve the control of Eastern Black Nightshade. So that three way mix followed by Sencor post emergence is, is a really good uh, combination of herbicides. Right. Authority, however, is a herbicide that is more biologically available on certain soil types, and you might see crop injury on those soil types. So if we have organic matter that's less than 2%, and also if the cation exchange capacity is low, so eight or less, you can see some fairly significant yield, and that will be associated, uh, sorry, uh, injury, and that will be associated with yield loss. Right, so keep that in mind. If you have a real sandy soil with low CEC levels, that can increase uh, injury from authority. So what you're looking for, and this this really shocked me because I didn't see this for the first two years that I worked with with this product. Um, but I put it on, you know, I I, I rotate my trials around the the different uh, fields that I have on station. And the year that I put it on to the, the low organic matter soil that I have, and the, the CEC level is, is around eight. Um, we got about two and a half inches of rain. Uh, it was about a week, a week and a half or so. Uh, no, it was about a week after transplanting. And it completely stopped the growth of, of those transplants. It was amazing. Um, so there are definitely concerns with authority on those soil types. And it's very clear on the label too. You look on the label, it does say low organic matter, low CEC soils, there's more potential for injury, right? The main thing that you're gonna see in terms of injury is the, the plants will appear stunted, they will stop growing. And both the above and below ground portions of the plant will stop growth, right? So if you dig up the plant, Basically what you're gonna see is the, the roots will not grow outside of, of the original root ball that they were in. You may see some increase in leaf biomass, but very, very little, right? And it's, it's gonna hold like that for much of the year. <clears throat> All right, and if you look at the, the bar that's down at the very bottom there, um, the yield loss that we can see can, can be up to 50%, right? It's, it's pretty significant. Um, and uh, so just, just keep that in mind. Growers may want to include authority because they have real heavy, tri, uh, heavy pressure of triazine resistant weeds or Easter black nightshade, um, but it's, it's really not suited to those low organic matter, low CEC soils. Having said that, if you look at the, the two red bars in the middle, if we have more than 2% organic matter and our, CR, our CEC levels are, are higher than eight, uh, tomatoes are are quite uh, are very tolerant to it. <clears throat> um, could I okay. just ask? Oh, yes, Nicola. Um, could I ask why, like, why on low organic matter soils um, with low CEC, that like why authority would um, kill the tomatoes? Okay, so the low organic matter that can affect most herbicides, right? And that's because what happens is the herbicide gets bound to the organic matter and the roots can't take it up. But the, the twist on it is the CEC levels, right? So if I have a low organic matter soil and my CEC is higher, that authority molecule doesn't get converted to a form that is bio as biologically available as if the CEC levels are very, very low. Right? And for that reason, the authority is, is more biologically available to it because there is actual an actual chemical transformation of the authority molecule on low CEC soils, right? Um, again, if we had 2% organic matter or higher and low CEC, the, the herbicide does get bound. And even that, that transform molecule, because it will be transformed, um, will not be available to 
but really, okay. really good question. Thanks. Okay. So again, Prowl is out there. It has been registered for a little while. Um, it's, it's really there for annual grasses. Um, you know, I, I think a big reason that growers are looking to use this is if they have heavy crabgrass pressure. So of all the grasses that we have to deal with, crabgrass can, can be a real issue in tomatoes. It's partially because of the rotation that, we're, that many growers, not all tomato growers, but many tomato growers also grow uh, seed corn. And because of the way that we treat seed corn, when we open up the, the canopy there, um, you know, sort of mid late summer, I guess, um, crabgrass will, will germinate, right? You'll get a flush of, of crabgrass that'll germinate and um, it can, can flower and set seed. And, and we do see an increase in crabgrass pressure, especially in those rotations where seed corn is, is grown um, with, uh, with tomatoes. All right, so Prowl is helpful this, this way. And, um, you know, when I've worked with Prowl in combination with Dual and Sencor, in, you know, in, in the trials that I've worked with, it's, uh, it's been a good combination. Um, I am still though concerned if we're growing on a, a low organic matter soil and uh, we get a real heavy rainfall event, I do think that there is some potential uh, to, to see some injury, especially in a tank, right? But again, the main benefit of having the prowl there would be for control of, of annual grasses like crabgrass. And for a lot of our seed corn tomato growers, um, there's a real benefit to, to having the prowl there. <clears throat> so when I looked at it, in combination with Dual and Sencor, I didn't see a, a lot of uh, injury in, in any of the treatments that I worked on. I didn't see any yield loss. Um, again, my concern would be if following a real heavy rainfall event, uh, greater than three inch rainfall event. <clears throat> okay, so the three-way tank mix is really good. Uh, Authority, Prowl, and Sencor. Um, I guess the, the concern that I have there is authority is quite weak on common ragweed. So common ragweed could be an escape that we're gonna have to deal with later on. Um, we didn't see any impacts with, uh, uh, on yield or, or maturity. Um, we are looking to build on this and, and looking at the four-way combination, authority, dual, prowl and Sencor. I've been asked about that. And, um, you know, that's, that's something I, I just, I don't know and, and I can't really comment on, but there have been some questions about including the dual in there. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, a combination that I just, I don't know about. <clears throat> and the reason it's the, the reason I understand why they're looking to do, do that is with the Authority Prowl Sencor mix, another weed that we might, we might have issues with is Eastern Black Nightshade because you have the authority and the dual together. It's a, a pretty good powerful mix for Eastern Black Nightshade control. If you drop the dual out, I do think there is some potential for uh, to nightshade for nightshade to become more of an issue. Okay, so that's the weed control portion of the, the presentation. And uh, sort of being mindful of my time here, I'm, I'm going to move through this uh, a, a little bit more, uh, more quickly. But um, the weeds that I have for you are, uh, are all at the, the seedling stage. And they're, they're common seedlings that you're going to see. My guess is you'll see these in almost every field that you're in. All right, so the first one is co uh, common lambs quarter. Common lambs quarter is the easiest way to identify this plant. As you see, these elongate oval cotyledons right away, you know that. And then um, if there are, uh, if there is a, a true leaf on it, you'll see a, a white sort of powdery coating on the surface of the leaves. Right? That's how we know we're, we're talking about common. All right, the next plant, again, I think is pretty easy to, uh, to identify is, um, is uh, I'm gonna try and annotate this a little bit. Uh, common ragweed. Common ragweed is real easy to identify. It's got these round, 
round cotyledons. And if you look carefully around the margin of the cotyledons, and especially if you flip the cotyledons over, you'll see small little black spots all around the margins of the cotyledon, all right? And they're much easier to see if you flip the, the cotyledon over and look at the underside, right? And then common ragweed, it has these sort of fern-like highly dissected leaves that, uh, that are covered with hair. Okay, the next plant here, um, <laughs> there's a, actually that's a purslane cotyledon underneath there, sorry guys. The, the plant that I want to draw your attention to is, uh, this is velvet leaf. Velvet leaf has got these uh, heart-shaped cotyledons and um, oval to heart-shaped leaves. It's called velvet leaf because it's covered all over with soft velvety hair. It's like you, you'll especially feel the hairs on the stems uh, on the petioles and also on the leaf surfaces, right? But uh, those heart-shaped cotyledons really give away velvet leaf at a, a very young stage. All right, redroot pigweed. Redroot pigweed does look similar to common lamb's quarters in that it has uh, these elongate oval cotyledons, very similar to it. However, the leaves do not have that powdery coating that lamb's quarters do. And also, if you look at the, the tip of the leaf in redroot pigweed, there's gonna be a small notch or a, uh, a small indentation, there, right? So right here at the, the tip of the leaf is where you'll see that small indentation in, um, in uh, common lambs, or sorry, in redroot pigweed. <laughs> All right. Eastern black nightshade is really tough to identify when it's in the seedling stage. Uh, guys, this picture that's in the top is probably about the, the diameter of a nickel. It's really, really small when it's at uh, the, uh, this is a one leaf uh, plant. Um, the cotyledons are oval, they're, they're pointed at their tips and they are actually covered with hairs. If you look under a hand lens, you'll see uh, hairs on the surface of the cotyledons. Um, the leaves will start out oval. The easiest way to, uh, to, to pick out an eastern black nightshade leaf is, again, if you flip the, the leaf over, remember I, I mentioned that with velvet leaf, but if you flip the leaf over on an eastern black nightshade plant, the underside of the, the leaf will have a, a dark purple, almost black color. Right? And that's eastern black nightshade. As the, the plant sizes up, the leaves will, will uh, change from oval to, to having these sort of scallop margins to them. Um, up to about the, the five or six leaf stage, you'll, you'll see the hairs on the leaves. But as the plant gets older, those hairs kind of wear off and um, the, they won't be there. Uh, but up to about the five leaf stage, you'll see, still see hairs on the leaf surface in eastern black nightshade. Right. We do have hairy nightshade in the province as well. And hairy nightshade is one of those weeds that's tough to manage with the, um, the pre-plant incorporated herbicides that we have, none of them have ac any activity on it. So likely you're going to see this in a lot of fields. Um, hairy nightshade, our, our only control for it is a post-emergence application of a herbicide that's called PRISM, All right? Hairy nightshade has cotyledons that are very similar to the uh, eastern black nightshade. They're oval and they're pointed at the tips. The leaves are oval, but if you flip them over, you will not see that purple or, or dark purple or black color on the underside of the leaves. It's, it's just green on the underside of the leaves. <laughs> okay. And again, if you're scouting a plant um, for control of uh, or if you're scouting for control of hairy nightshade, this plant that we've got down here, and again, uh, <laughs> you can see this is an old picture. This is when I used, uh, it was, well, it was a digital camera, but uh, it was a camera that had a lens cover. Um, about the two leaf stage, two to four leaf stage is the maximum size that you want to be applying your herbicide to control it. So guys, if you're scouting for this plant, it's, it's got to be very, very small, about two to four leaves uh, for us to get acceptable control. <clears throat> All right. And then the, I, I think the last thing in terms of the, the weeds themselves that I'll mention is when you're going to be finding them. So lamb's quarters, lamb's quarters has been germinating already. 
right? It's out there in fields already. Uh, and, and there are, likely you're also seeing some common ragweed out there. So it starts germinating late in April and will continue to germinate through a lot of the summer. Um, uh, common ragweed is also up. In the next week or so, you're gonna start to see velvet leaf. Um, the week after that, you'll, you'll start to see redwood pigweed. And then by the end of the month, the third week of May, um, the nightshades will be germinating, right? So the, these, like I said, lamb's quarters is already up and out and, um, and, and common ragweed is, is germinating as well. <clears throat> okay, so for post-emergence herbicides, again, the only reason that I'm mentioning these is to keep in mind that there is the potential for them to cause injury. I already talked about Sencor. Sencor is that herbicide that causes the, the yellowing in between the leaf veins. Pinnacle and Prism, though, the injury symptoms can be a little bit different, right? So Pinnacle was registered to control triazine resistant lamb's quarters, and it does a fantastic job of it. It's really effective on it. However, there are some tomato cultivars out there that are very, very sensitive to it. All right, and the injury symptoms that you're going to see, you're gonna see chlorosis will be the, one of the symptoms. You'll also see the leaves droop, right? Um, we don't often, you know, we, we don't expect to always see this type of injury, but with tomatoes and pinnacle, what I've seen is, is the plants will droop and sometimes the plants will, will actually lean over, right? Not just the, the leaves, but the, the whole plant, if they're really sensitive to it, right? Growers are giving, given a listing of, uh, you know, the, the different uh, tomato cultivars that they're going to be grown, and they'll be given a list of which are sensitive and which are tolerant to pinnacle, right? So we do hope that this doesn't happen, right? Um, but just keep in mind that there are some very, very sensitive uh, cultivars out there. Okay, so there's cultivar sensitivity. Another thing that we do see if pinnacle gets applied in really hot weather, so when, when we get up above 30 degrees Celsius, we can get some injury even in cultivars that are tolerant um, to, uh, to pinnacle, right? And this is a picture I took in the first summer after pinnacle was registered. This was in uh, the summer of 2002. I'd only been working at Ridgetown campus for two years and this entire block of 9553s was yellow and I thought, oh my gosh, what the heck have I done? Um, we'd had this, this cultivar in our trials. Um, the, the, uh, the plants did, you know, they, they outgrew that injury. I came back here a week later and, and I didn't see it. The grower did think though that his plants were about three or four days delayed, right? Um, and, and that was because it had been applied in the afternoon and, and it was quite hot when the application had been made. All right, so that chlorosis and, and also a little bit of leaf droop went along with that. <laughs> All right, so should I wait to apply pinnacle if temperatures are really, really warm? And my recommendation is yes, wait until later in the afternoon until temperatures have, have dropped down below say 28 degrees Celsius to apply it especially if we've been going through a, a period of really hot dry weather. <clears throat> right. Prism, you know what? I worked on Prism for about 16 or 17 years. We applied it at overlap rates. I never saw any injury associated with it. And then two years ago, we did a trial where we sprayed Prism on uh, some, some advanced plants. And uh, we waited until the heat of the day. And I think it was, it was close to 40 degrees Celsius and we got this. So prism can cause this kind of injury as well. Um, tomato plants are, are able to metabolize it more quickly. We don't have the cultivar sensitivity that we do with pinnacle, but pin prism can cause that type of injury where you'll get yellowing um, in the new growth. And uh, we did get a little bit of leaf droop. That, uh, that was a first for me. And, and again, it was something I hadn't seen in many years. Some growers have commented that they do think they get this injury if the transplants are, are growing really, really quickly. Um, and and uh, I've heard it referred to as yellow heart, where the, the, the new growing tissues will emerge yellow after an application of prism. 
I will say though that I know Sencor was applied along with the prism, which I do think um, helped to uh, help maybe increase the the chance of that injury that had occurred. And then a couple of other questions that I've been asked um, is about uh, using Sandia. So Sandia is registered for use in tomatoes um, and uh, for, for post-emergence uh, post applications in tomatoes. Um, it is not a very effective herbicide for the control of triazine resistant lambs quarters, right? This was a trial that was set out purposely to try and answer that question. And, um, when those lambs quarters got past a, a certain stage, it, it really didn't do a, a very good job of, uh, of controlling it compared to PRISM, which is the, the herbicide that um, we have a registration for control of triazine resistant lambs quarters. <clears throat> okay. And um, however, I did mention ragweed, ragweed as a possible escape. And again, um, Sandia is a good a good option for control of uh, of common ragweed. <clears throat> okay. In terms of the grass weeds that are going to be a problem, I mentioned this. Um, I mentioned crabgrass. That's going to be the main grass weed that uh, that you're going to have to deal with. Foxtails and fall panicum are are in many fields in the province, but the crabgrasses of all of them are the most difficult to manage. Now. I'm going to finish up with a note to try and reinforce one of the things that Amanda had said earlier on. It's about taking really good pictures. So if you're using pictures to help you identify weeds that you know, you're not 100% sure about, when it comes to grasses, here's the three things that I want you to focus on. First, get a really good close-up picture of the ligula, right? And what you're looking for is to see whether or not the, the ligula is just a solid piece of tissue that gets referred to as a membranous ligula. Or is it just a little fringe of hairs? So that's the first thing. Second thing, make sure you get a good picture that shows what kind of hairs are on the leaf blade, right? So the leaf blade is the upper part of the leaf, the main part of the leaf that, that you see branching off the stem. Look for hairs or the presence or absence of hairs on the, uh, the leaf blade. And also look to see if the hairs are concentrated down just at the bottom of the leaf blade or if you see hairs the whole way up, okay? And then finally, get a third picture of the leaf sheet, right? And again, what you're looking for is the presence of absence of hairs on the leaf sheet itself. And also another place you, you do wanna take careful note of is along the margin of the leaf sheet. Most grasses do not have hairs on them, but fall panicum does, all right? So if you see hairs along the margin of the leaf sheet, you know that you've got fall panic, right? So those are the three pictures. If you're, if you're taking, uh, if you're using images of grasses, get a good close up of the ligule, a good shot of the leaf blade and a good shot of the leaf. <laughs> All right. And um, the, the reason that I'm pointing out crabgrasses as an issue is because it can, okay, so it can build up in, um, especially in rotations where we're growing seed corn with tomatoes. Another thing is, um, so prism, I did talk a little bit about prism. Um, you know, we, we have prism there to control hairy nightshade. Prism is actually also a really good grass herbicide, but it's Achilles heel is crabgrass. It's not very good on crabgrass, right? So if if a grower, if you're seeing a lot of dead grass and and um, and one grass species in particular escaping, it's likely that they've used prism and that they haven't used another post-emergence grass herbicide like Venture or like Post Ultra um, to to kill the grass. Right? So prism is weak on on crabgrass. <clears throat> Um, I'm going to leave it at that, guys. Amanda, I think uh, I, I think I've have I gone over my time, Amanda, or uh... yeah, a little bit. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. Um, I'll I'll stop there, and uh, I guess uh, we'll we'll do the uh, the weed identification. Yep. Okay. No problem. I will uh, get that going here. So last quiz. I promise. 
I won't make you do any more after this. Okay. So five questions, let's go. Question one, this weed has developed resistance to the triazine herbicides and is widely distributed around Ontario. What weed is it? We'll give a couple seconds. The answer is common lambs quarters. Question two, this weed cannot be controlled with any post-emergent herbicides registered in tomato. What is this weed? The answer is Eastern Black Nightshade. Question three, the post-emergence herbicide that gives the best control of this weed is Sandia. What is this weed? The answer is common ragweed. Question four, this weed germinates over an extended period during the summer and there are some group one resistant populations in Ontario. What is this weed? We just talked about it. The answer is large crabgrass. And final question, this weed has Seed that can last several decades in the soil. What is this weed? Notice the heart-shaped cotyledons. Answer is velvet leaf. Okay. So we're gonna move on to soils and soil sampling with uh, Ann Verhollen. And Ann, whenever you're ready, we can start your screen sharing. Okay. Working on it. There we go. Yep, looks good. Okay, as long as that's what you're seeing. Okay, so um, normally we get a chance to go outside and typically on a day like today, we'd be doing it very quickly, wouldn't we? Um, but it's always a nice break. Unfortunately, this year, once again, we're inside. So let's just take a quick look at soil sampling and scouting for, for IPM. Um, the soil really does tell you a story. You can take a look at it from a couple of different points of view. There's the diagnostics from general field observations and then also diagnostics from lab samples. So things like soil profile, the texture, drainage infiltration, compaction structure, those are the things you can observe in field. You can also take samples and get fertility numbers, pH, um, EC or salts, and of course nematodes. We're going to get into that in a second. So with infield diagnostics, one of the easiest thing, once you already have a soil probe in your hand, it's really easy to check because sometimes it's a little surprising how big a difference we see out in the field in terms of landscape. All these tomato fields and pepper fields will look fairly flat. Um, I'm not originally from Kent County, but it took me a while to figure out that those little rises are, are actual hills here. Um, it just looks flat, but when you start probing with a soil probe, often you'll find things are really different. And one sandy loam is not the same as another sandy loam. So big difference say between a barium sandy loam and a fox sandy loam. So for example, the profile on the, the left here is actually a barium sandy loam. And the cool thing about that is it is underlaid by usually some clay down at depth. So those barium sands are so very productive because it holds up moisture. Um, one of the other things we'll see a big difference is the depth of the topsoil or a horizon. And sometimes that can explain a lot of what's going on in the crop. And of course, you can also find things like compaction with, with a soil probe or a shovel. So we can take a look really quickly at soil profiles with shovels, augers, um, and of course, uh, our normal probe. And you can actually take a soil sample with a shovel. It's a lot more time consuming. Most outlets, most consultants will have some soil probes available to you. Structure also plays a part. So this is more of a silty clay, um, something you're more like to, you still might see with some tomato fields and certainly some parts of some tomato fields, you might see some silty clays. We can see a tremendous difference based on uh, management. These two are managed very differently. One's got a lot of hay in the rotation. The other one is continuous corn, lots of residue, but you don't see the same development of the aggregation. So this plays a part 
in how well the water goes in. We have the same thing on some of our, our sandy loams, especially the heavier ones. We can see some real differences. There's also a color difference here, which is the difference in organic matter. And these two soils actually have more than a one point difference in uh, actual organic matter just based on management. So you can see up close that there is a significant difference in structure. On the left, we can see we've got some really nice aggregation, whereas we seem to see a lot of slaking. This is a field that continuous cornfield has a tendency if we get a pound of rain, it's gonna crest and the water's gonna move off and there's not gonna be as much water there for the crop and the roots are not gonna be able to get through, usually because of things like compaction. Um, something to keep in mind as you're scouting fields, it's not always insects and diseases or even herbicides. Sometimes it's things that are going on in the soil. And one of the big things that we see, especially in this area, are soils that over time have developed some compaction. And the thing is with this is that you don't see what was done because tillage has hidden it. So if you start seeing patterns, um, you can see restricted root systems, things like that, that'll give you an idea that there might be some compaction going on. We often now see headlands with standing water and that's a concern because it shouldn't be that way. And we see it often in, in areas where there's maybe a more traffic in a field. If you start digging up plants, you may see some flattened roots, that's actually corn. At the picture at the bottom, that's a tomato field. And in this case, the field wasn't doing well. It had started off well, uh, but we got into a dry period. Soils get um, more restrictive to growth. The, there's more resistance to weed expansion as soils dry down. And there's a platiness. You can see that it's breaking off in sheets. That's what my hand is holding there at the bottom of the root system. And because of that platiness, as it was drying down, it was really interfering with the roots moving out. They weren't moving out in, in the pattern that you would expect to see with tomatoes. Now this field got a nice shower shortly after I took this picture and then it took off again. But just that little bit of structural problems puts an additional stress if we've got um, some dry conditions and, and things like that. So soil sampling, this is usually the part that I really focus on because we'll go outside and we'll take a look at doing some soil sampling. My basic soil sampling kit is a probe. I pr personally prefer these Oakfield ones because the neat part about these is that the tip comes off. So when you bang it up on a stone or something like that, you can replace the tip. The other thing that I do like is this little foot pedal that you can see on it because that foot pedal gives you just enough leverage that you can get in the ground as it's starting to dry down or if it's very firm. And the nice thing with that foot pedal is it moves so you can go to quite a depth. Um, so lots of options out there as far as different soil probes. I do like the oak field, but there's lots of other ones out there. Big thing is make sure it's clean and clean it out completely in between. Um, having a clean bucket and also having bags and boxes, whichever you're using, depending on the lab that they're going to, some sort of a writing utensil because take it from me, you never totally remember if you don't write it down. So it's always best to, to label those, those bags and boxes as you're doing the work or in advance so that when you leave the field, everything's labeled, there's no confusion. And of, of course, a cooler if you're doing any samples that require active cooling like uh, nematodes. When we're looking at problem areas, it's a good idea to collect samples from both good and bad, same as you would with tissue sampling, those kinds of things. Sometimes it pays to do the transition area too. That often gives you a, an idea. Pay attention as you're taking those soil samples because you'll feel the structure, how well that soil is or how open it is as you're putting the probe into it. And that can tell you a lot. So when we get into soil samples, there's three basic kinds. There's the basic fertility and pH sample. That's gonna be six inches in depth or 15 centimeters. It can be kept at room temperature. And usually if we're doing something diagnostic, we're gonna take you know, 15, 20, 25 different cores, mix them up and uh, subsample from that into the box. Similarly, um, nitrate samples. Uh, in that case, we're taking a 12 inch sample. In this case, we wanna keep it cool and not or freeze it immediately. And nematodes are a little bit different because they're a living animal. So we're gonna take a six inch sample in the end, but we're actually gonna take it at about seven or eight inches, take the top couple inches off. 
In this one, we wanna keep it cool, but don't let it freeze. So we wanna treat it very gently. And as I said, the key is here, nematodes must be alive to be extracted. So we do have to be gentle with them. And the reason that we're taking off that top couple centimeters or top inch or so of surface soil, because that's the area where the temperature fluctuates and the moisture fluctuates a lot. And so we're not gonna get an accurate measure of, and we're not gonna have as many live nematodes. And if we're depending on them to swim out of the soil sample to be extracted, that's pretty critical. And again, it is critical to handle and cool them gently, don't shock them, and then get them to the lab as soon as possible. And that's that for soil sampling. Good luck this year. Thanks, Anne. Any questions for Anne? I don't see anything in the chat. So if not, if you do come up with anything, please feel free to put it in the chat. We're gonna keep an eye on it. And um, we're gonna move on to nutrient deficiencies and um, tissue sampling with Tejendra. So Tejendra, did you want to um, play the video you got? Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I think I'm the last presenter today and thank you for bearing with us. First of all, let me thank Amanda for including me to this group. I'm really happy to be here to talk about measures, nutrients, their deficiency symptoms, as well as tissue sampling procedures, focusing on tomato and pepper today. And today I'm gonna play the recording of my video, actually, which was recorded yesterday, focusing on tomato and pepper. And uh, we had a similar presentation last week on IPM intro training. And based on the feedback we received, that was that went really well. So, but I will be here until the end of my presentation. So please feel free to write your comments or questions on the chat box, and I would be happy to answer them at the end of my presentation. So with that, so let me start my presentation. Hello, everybody. My name is Tejendra Chapagai. I'm your new soil fertility specialist in horticultural crops with Omafra and I'm based in Guelph. Today, I'm gonna talk about major symptoms of nutrient deficiencies in tomato and pepper. I would also discuss tissue sampling procedures in tomato and pepper that help to manage deficiency or toxicity of nutrients in crop plants. Before jumping into the deficiency symptoms, I would like to talk a little bit about essential nutrients for crop plants. And nutrients are mainly divided into three different categories based on the quantities required for plant growth and reproduction. They are primary nutrients, secondary nutrients, and micronutrients. Primary nutrients are required by the plants in the large amount, while secondary nutrients are required in the moderate amount, and micronutrients are required by the plants in the small amount. And these primary nutrients are also called as the macronutrients. And there are six nutrients that fall into this category. They are nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen from the air and water, while the remaining macronutrients must be obtained from the soil. And there are Three nutrients that fall into the category of secondary nutrients, they are calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And referring to the micronutrients, they are as important as the primary and secondary nutrients, but they are needed in much smaller quantities by the plant. And there are seven nutrients that fall into this category. They are boron, zinc, molybdenum, manganese, iron, copper, and chlorine. And in this presentation today, we are not talking about the roles of each and every nutrient. Instead, we are talking about some major symptoms when these nutrients are deficient in plants. And it is important to note that these symptoms can be confusing because many plant nutrient deficiencies share the same or very similar symptoms. Also, they can be similar to symptoms of many plant diseases. For example, 
Symptoms due to deficiency of nutrients can be observed in different parts of the plant. And when we observe some symptoms first in younger leaves or growing points, that could be because of the deficiency of sulfur, iron, copper, or manganese. Because plants do not mobilize these nutrients from older to younger leaves. But when the symptoms are first visible in older leaves, that could be because of the deficiency of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, zinc, or molybdenum. Also, it is important to note that calcium and boron deficiency symptoms seldom appear on older leaves. The other example is leaf chlorosis. And when this symptom is combined with retarded or stunted growth of plants, that could be because of nitrogen, sulfur, or copper deficiency. But if the growth is not retarded, that could be because of the deficiency of phosphorus. Similarly, when nitrogen is deficient in plants, we observe yellowing of older leaves. But when the plant is deficient in sulfur, we observe yellowing of younger leaves. And this image also shows that the deficiency symptoms of boron, calcium, sulfur, iron, manganese, and copper are first observed in younger leaves. While the deficiency symptoms of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, molybdenum, and zinc are first visible on older leaves. Now, let us talk about the major deficiency symptoms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And when the plant is deficient in nitrogen, the most common symptoms that we observe are yellowing of older leaves, thinner stem, and stunted growth of the plant. Because nitrogen is mainly responsible for greenness and leafy growth in plant. And it is the part of chlorophyll and plays crucial role in photosynthesis. However, the typical symptoms associated with phosphorus deficiency is reddish or purplish lower leaves. We can also observe poor flowering and fruiting as well as premature fruit drop due to phosphorus deficiency. Similarly, when the plant is deficient in potassium, the tips and margin of the leaves turn yellow and the plants become vulnerable or susceptible to stress conditions, both biotic as well as abiotic stresses. We can also observe blotchy or uneven ripening in tomato due to potassium deficiency. And the major symptoms associated with calcium deficiency in fruits and vegetables involve rotting from tip of the fruits, which we refer to as blossom in rot of fruits and vegetables. This can be observed in tomato, bill, and jalapeno paper too. And when the plant is deficient in magnesium, we usually observe yellow and white patches between green veins of leaves. Plants also produce poor flower and low quality fruits due to magnesium deficiency. And symptoms associated with sulfur deficiency are first observed in younger leaves because plants do not mobilize sulfur from older to younger leaves. So the younger leaves turn pale green to yellow. We also observe stunted growth or retarded growth of plants due to sulfur deficiency. And when the plant is deficient in boron, we may observe brittle petioles that could break up suddenly. Also, the younger leaves remain small, called inwards and deformed. We can also observe chapped surface, surface on fruits, as well as hollowness or puffiness in tomato, which is also caused by extreme environmental conditions, such as high or low temperatures. And with severe boron deficiency, the growing points could die and the crop will be lost. And the common symptoms associated with zinc deficiency are development of small leaves, which we refer to as little leaf symptom. Sometimes the leaf tissue looks strong and leathery, being slightly curved downward. We also observe yellowing of young leaves between green veins, wilting, poor fruiting, and dieback symptoms due to zinc deficiency. 
and when the plant is deficient in molybdenum leaves turn yellow and pale between veins also leaves may become bluish green or they may not open completely similarly when plants are deficient in manganese we may observe yellowish gold to brown spot on leaves we can also observe chlorotic zones in younger leaves along with stunted growth or delayed maturity in plants while intervenal chlorosis in young leaves and stunted growth are major symptoms associated with iron deficiency and the common symptoms associated with copper deficiency are wilting of young leaves without yellowing and leaves developing brown spots similarly we can also observe dieback from leaf tips development of multiple buds and production of gum pockets due to copper deficiency and this picture is to demonstrate some general symptoms of nutrient deficiency on paper leaf and as we discussed earlier calcium and iron deficiency symptoms are first observed in younger leaves or new growth while the deficiency symptoms of nitrogen phosphorus potassium and magnesium are first observed in older leaves now i am going to talk about the second component of my presentation which is tissue sampling procedures in tomato and paper and tissue sampling is important to identify if a if a specific nutrient is excessive adequate or deficient during the growing season and to correct immediately if they are deficient or if they are more than adequate in crop plants and tissue sampling and analysis is also important because there are no accredited soil test available for boron copper iron or molybdenum and plant tissue analysis can provide information to help manage these nutrients but it is important to note that the tissue analysis could be unreliable sometimes for evaluating nitrogen and zinc due to timing and growth stage of the plant therefore plant tissue analysis is most useful when it is combined with the soil test along with a visual inspection of the crop and soil conditions the table here shows sampling time as well as some information about what and from where to samples this also includes some precautions that need to be considered while collecting tissue samples from tomato and paper based on omafra publication 611 and as mentions here the sampling time for direct seeded tomato and paper is early or first bloom stage while the sampling time for transplanted tomato and paper is 3 to 4 weeks after transplanting then we can continue sampling every 7 to 14 days throughout the season and for both tomato and paper we collect the petiole from young but most recently mature leaf this is usually 3 to 4 petioles down from the top of the plant and the petiole should be separated from the leaflets immediately and those petioles are mainly used for nitrate nitrogen phosphorus and potassium analysis while the leaflets are mainly used for secondary and micronutrient analysis and regardless of the crop or sample parts sample should be collected from at least 50 plants randomly from across the field because labs need at least 250 gram fresh weight samples for processing and analysis and sometimes we may require collecting samples for problem diagnostics that means to determine or identify the problem and correct deficiency when needed and in that case samples are collected separately from normal growth and affected areas to compare healthy and affected areas and care should be taken not to sample dead plants for diagnostic tissue sampling and this slide is all about some do's or don'ts that we need to consider before during and after tissue sampling and let me talk about some do's first 
we should sample enough materials that means 50 leaves or petioles or 250 gram face weight samples for field ground vegetables second we should separate the petiole from the leaflet immediately to stop mobilization or translocation of nutrients after harvest and third we should put samples into paper bags label them and send to the lab for analysis and some don'ts include do not collect chlorotic or dead tissue or tissues damaged by insect pest and disease second do not collect plant tissues contaminated with soil because contamination provides incorrect results and third do not ship the samples in plastic bags because if we put samples into plastic bags they will sweat and rot so some take home messages from my presentation today are symptoms can be confusing because many plant nutrient deficiencies share the same or very similar symptoms. Also, they can be similar to symptoms of many plant disease. Second, a certain way to know if a plant or crop is suffering from a nutrient deficiency is to have a soil test. We can also conduct tissue sample test for quick correction of deficiencies. Third, plant tissue analysis is most useful when it is combined with the soil test, along with the visual inspection of the crop and soil conditions. And fourth, tissue sampling methods differ with crop type, and therefore attention is required while sampling and handling of the tissue samples. And as I said earlier, this presentation is mainly based on the third edition of Omafra's Soil Fertility Handbook. And the PDF of this handbook is full color and available for free on Omafra website, while the hard copy is black and white and available for $20 plus tax and shipping from Service Ontario. And thank you for listening to my presentation today. If you have any questions or comments, I would be happy to answer them. Also, you can reach out to me using this email. And at the end of my presentation, I would like to request all of you to visit soiltestmanager.ca, which is a new tool developed by OSCIA and OMAFRA for soil fertility recommendations. Thank you again and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Tajendra. Um, so there was a question for you in the chat uh, from Phyllis. Why are your why are petioles used instead of leaves for some deficiencies? That's a good question. So actually, we can also collect leaf for tissue sampling process. But sometimes for major nutrients such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, we usually prefer petioles compared to the leaf. Because in petioles, the nutrients are more collected from the leaf, you know, they are translocated from leaf to the petioles. So, so that those sections are considered as best, you know. And in general, what we do is when you send samples to the labs, they compare those values with the standard uh, samples or standard level of nutrients that are available in the lab. And we use, usually our labs have those standard values based on petiole nutrients level in the petioles. That's why we collect petiole samples for some plants. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so if there's any other questions, um, please feel free to put those in the chat. I'm not seeing anything right now. Um, uh, just a couple of things to wrap up and then we can let you guys go. I just, first of all, would like to thank all of our presenters today, um, Tajendra, and Darren, Cheryl, uh, thank you for taking the time out to come out here and give us this uh, great information and a lot of those resources. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention, everyone, to the chat box. I just shared a link there to a survey. Um, so there's a quick evaluation there. It'll only take a couple minutes of your time. And it really helps direct us uh, for future events and make sure that uh, the information that we're giving is useful, valuable to you guys, because um, we really want to make sure that we're giving everybody the information that you need to do your jobs properly. Um, so if you don't mind, just click that link and um, it really will only take a couple minutes, I promise. I made them mostly multiple choice. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions. Um, so I will hang around for a couple more minutes just in case, but um, 
enjoy the extra 13 minutes of your day.